year ago is about 6.1 million workers short. We had both the service sector that was decimated, right, by the shutdown and people just, you know, waiters, waitresses, hostesses, hotel staff, et cetera, um, actually weren't working. And in the wake of, of the pandemic, particularly childcare costs have really shot up. And it's in some ways at the low end of the wage spectrum has like kind of canceled out the benefits of work once you add up the commuting costs and the time and the childcare and the gas and all of that stuff at the very low end of the wage spectrum. It doesn't make sense for a lot of these people to go back to work and you have a lot of those folks still on the sidelines at the other end of the spectrum. A lot of people retired early right their house went up a bunch they were 50 55 getting ready to retire in the next five 10 years anyway. They sold those houses, went paid cash for something, moved close to their grandkids, did all of that stuff. And, and that's why, in some ways, this kind of one weapon that the Fed has in fighting inflation, which is rising interest rates, isn't particularly effective, right? If you're somebody that retired early because your house shot up by $400,000 and you just paid cash for something, you don't care how high interest rates go, you're not like coming back to work, right? So, um, that is why this very, very strong economy means that this labor shortage persists. And this is why the financial markets really freak out whenever we get a good economic number is that it, it means that maybe um, inflation, this last mile on inflation will be really hard to get rid of. And I always kind of like equate inflation to like losing weight, right? When you're um, really out of shape like I was, it's like, you know, you get really encouraged because the first like couple of weeks in the gym, it's like melting right off. But then like when you want the six pack, you're still like having to grind forever for months. And that's kind of I think this last mile on inflation will be kind of equivalent to that just because it's going to be the hardest to get rid of because it involves growing the labor force back to where it was or alternatively having companies doing a lot worse and not having the open positions to fill in in the first place. And I think, although I would argue that the economy may not be as strong as what these head, headline numbers would have you believe, the Fed thinks they are. And if you look at, you know, we don't get a new dot plot, but this is their kind of forward looking guidance of where they think in, interest rates need to be next year. We won't, we, they only do these every three months. So we didn't get one after yesterday's meeting, but we will get one after the December meeting. But you can see even just from June, to September, they became decidedly more pessimistic about the outlook for rates. They didn't raise rates in September. They didn't raise rates yesterday either, but their expectation for where rates are gonna be next year and the year after have gotten progressively worse, right? So next year, if you go back in time to June, they were expecting to lower rates by about hundred basis points next year, fast forward to September, they expected to only cut it by 50 basis points and 25 and 26, we're still at relatively high uh, levels of Fed funds rate, right? So this is important for folks to understand. They came out, even though they haven't raised rates in a while, they've really stuck to their guns in this higher for mo uh, longer kind of mantra philosophy where they're really not going to back down on rates until uh, they see this inflation get much closer to that 2% uh, number. And you can see that that is what the bond market has really responded to over the last 12 weeks or so. This uh, blue line, which represents 10-year treasury yields, has really shot up by about 150 basis points, almost 200 basis points. It's approaching 5%. It's come down a little bit after yesterday's meeting because the Fed did nothing. Um, but this is what really matters for mortgage rates, right, is what happens with the 10-year treasury note. And in some ways, although this is really bad news for where mortgages are today, what we're seeing over the last three months actually makes the most sense out of anything we've seen in the last couple of years. If you look at the black line, right, the Fed funds rate, it was going up every single meeting pretty much, right, by like 50, 25, sometimes 75 basis points with a clear indication that they were going to take us to a 5%, 5.5% Fed funds rate. And yet from mid-2022 onward, the 10-year Treasury was like in denial, right? It was doing nothing. It was pretty flat um, and not going up despite those clear indications. And only now have they kind of woken up and realized that, man, they're not going to bring rates down super quick and we got to start building this in um, to, to the price of these bonds. And if you just kind of, this isn't my forecast, but if you just take that dot plot that the Fed put out and you put on some basic spreads for a yield curve and mortgage rate spreads above and beyond 
um, you know, a 10 year treasury, which is usually about 170 basis points right now, it's almost 300 basis points, but you can just do some simple back of the napkin stuff. And so for those buyers that are suffering from the brother-in-law effect or think that we're going to see super low rates right around the corner. I read an article, someone was like, oh, look at this article. It says 5% rates by the end of the year. I just don't see it unless that Fed outlook becomes a lot more pessimistic about the economy. The only way they're going to lower rates a lot more than what they told us is that the economy is doing a lot worse and inflation's a lot lower and there's more unemployment and all of that stuff. And so, you know, I think we're we're probably in store for a high 7% you know, rate, at least through the first quarter of this year, it will gradually start to come down. But if you look at that kind of long-term trajectory, you know, somebody asked me the other day, like, when are we gonna be back at 3% rates? Um, and I think that is probably, I, I think if we get to 3% rates again, we're gonna have much bigger fish to fry um, because something really big and negative happened to the economy, like of the magnitude of like a COVID or something coming out of nowhere, that's the only way we're going to see something like that again. And, and again, it's incumbent on us to remind folks that, you know, the best time to buy a house in California is 20 years ago, but the second best time is today because over the long term, prices only ever go one way. You know, we have these ups and downs in the economy, um, but we also have a fundamental gap between supply and demand. That's meant prices always only ever go up in California. And I'll show you some data to that extent. But I do think that, you know, we should expect demand to remain relatively soft. We, I think, just got a new Freddie Mac number this morning. I didn't get to check it, but Mortgage News Daily had rates coming down to seven and a half percent. But you can see we're basically triple where we were about a year and a half ago. And it's important to, to kind of both as, as real estate practitioners to understand that this takes a big bite out of buyer demand, right? You don't qualify for as much mortgage today as you did um, even earlier this year and certainly not a couple of years ago. Um, but, you know, I think that demand is also a little bit more depressed than it needs to be. But, and this is from our online purchasing power calculator. If you go to our website, you can kind of pull this up and plug in your clients like profile and things like that. I initially built this tool as a way to kind of illustrate to buyers like the cost of waiting for interest rates to go up. But increasingly, I think this is like a great tool to use with sellers who don't understand how much the market has changed. And maybe like me, where you're really like loath to lower the price. But if you take this like $200,000 a year hypothetical uh, household here in Los Angeles County, and you go back to when rates were at 3%, to get a payment that was 35% of their gross income, which was about 5,800 bucks in this case um, per month, it equated to a $1.3 million roughly purchase price, right? Well, those folks who were um, scared that the market was going to tank or the prices were going to go down and sat on the sidelines um, saw rates rise to 7%. And now to get that same $5,800 a month mortgage payment, um, they're qualifying for about $300,000 less home, right? You even had people earlier this year thinking they were going to wait for prices to tank even more. And guess what happened? Prices uh, continued to go up and rates went up to 8% uh, a handful of times, actually, over the last like two weeks. And they lost another $70,000 worth of purchase income. So they're, you know, especially through the lens of rates that aren't expected to come plummeting down to 5% anytime soon. Um, you know, the fact that rates will stay high and prices will probably continue to go up given how tight the inventory is means that you're just falling farther and farther behind the eight ball in terms of what you can actually uh, afford out there. But I think, again, this is important information for sellers to understand because the market has softened in the last three months. Part of it's seasonal, right? And we always have like, the winter months that are worse than the spring home buying season and things like that. But it's been exacerbated by these high rates and homes aren't selling as quick. More sellers are uh, reducing, right? Offering other concessions, rate buy downs, closing costs, et cetera. Um, and I think that this is important as a seller, having just gone through it, you know, when your agent calls and tells you to lower price, you're super mad, right? I'm like, what happened? My brother sold his house three months ago and it was easy and it was great. He got all this money and all of this stuff. And I don't want to, you know, get rid of my boat or give up the 40 grand that my agent thought we should cut by 
Um, but through this lens, right, when you see the impacts to purchasing power where they went from 1.3 million down to 830, um, you know, in some ways you're lucky to find somebody to take it at 840. The pool of buyers at each individual price point has shrunk because people all along the spectrum are suffering from the same effect proportionately, right? Where you've lost a lot of purchasing power in terms of what you now uh, qualify for. And that is why you see the demand numbers today, and this is new purchase applications. They're pretty much at the lowest levels that we've seen going all the way back to the 2008 uh, financial crisis. And I think certainly part of this is purchasing power having been eroded by these higher rates. But I think this is also an opportunity in the sense that some of this is like artificially depressed, right? Like you have a lot of qualified buyers that are still sitting on the sidelines because their brother-in-law told them the foreclosures are right around the corner and all that stuff. And, and I think this is where we have the opportunity to maybe move the needle, not back to those 15-year highs, but getting buyers focused on the long-term benefits of home ownership and not what happens over the next 12 to 18 months and some of those fundamentals that say prices um, over the long term will be right back on that upward trend. But it's also important for us to keep a kind of nose to the grindstone approach as realtors too, because we were rebounding through the first half of this year from those super low levels that we hit back in November. I think we were at 230,000 units or so after having been up at about 500,000 units. So the market was like cut in half from the levels that we had just a couple of years ago when rates were at 3%. But you can see as rates have started to ratchet back up, the tail end of this chart has us threatening those low levels that we hit last winter. And I think we should keep those belts tight and expect the next couple of months will be pretty lackluster because those buyer demand numbers haven't turned around yet. Um, and mostly again, not because of a lack of buyers, even at those depressed levels of mortgage applications, that's still more buyers than there are listings out there, right? So it's not that the market, the bottom's not gonna fall out of the market. And I think that 230 will be the low point, but we just can't expect this kind of bounce back recovery to 500,000 units. Uh, again, because the, the demand is still low, that will start to improve as rates start to come down, but inventory is still uh, very, very tight. When you look regionally, and I brought some local data just to kind of illustrate, but if you look regionally across the entire state, you don't see a lot of variation, right? It doesn't matter if you're in the Bay Area where prices are 2 million bucks or here in LA or in the Central Coast where I live or even up in Lake Shasta and places like that. You're seeing basically that same kind of 25 to 30 percent um, pullback across the state. And it's really a macroeconomics driven show at this point associated with these high rates lock in effect. That's happening everywhere, right? It doesn't matter if you're in a $300,000 home or a $3 million home leaving your current interest rate means a much bigger interest, uh, mortgage payment, right? And that's just simple math, no matter where you are. Where you do see a little bit more variation is when you break it down segment by segment. If you go back to the boom times when rates were at 3% and California's transaction numbers were growing by about 20%, it was mostly because the top end, everything over a million was doing really well, right? It was doubling or more than doubling on a year-to-year -year basis in terms of transactions. Um, the bottom end, if you look under 500,000, right, you don't see that much difference in the gray stuff compared to the blue stuff, right? Like this year looks pretty much the same under 500 as it has, even when rates are at 3%, we weren't getting a lot of growth of under $500,000 homes. That's just our most inventory constraint segment. We just went from doubling at the top end of the market where one, two, three, five million dollar homes were more than canceling out the declines at the bottom to a top end that has moderated a bit. Guess what? The top end is still a huge opportunity in terms of segments, right? If you grow by 110% and then shrink by 30% after that, you're still about 80% ahead of the game, right? If you look at the number of transactions over a million, it's still above those pre-pandemic levels. It's just not doubling from the year before two years in a row. Um, the way that it was when rates were at 3%. So this is still a huge opportunity market, I think, at the high end uh, and in some of those communities with really high prices. And again, those high income earners are outperforming everybody else economically and are still doing well and qualifying things like that. But we just can't rely on the top end to carry every other segment that's more affected um, and where people aren't able to absorb the effect of these uh, higher rates, right? We're actually, again, doing a little bit better 
um, across various parts of the San Gabriel Valley, right? You can see um, in September, sales were only down about 15% compared to 30%, but still in that kind of same range that we saw uh, with prices actually still growing, right? And just a testament to how much this is a supply-driven show. Monterey Park um, last month had 13 listings available for sale at the point in time when we check this. Um, Temple City is doing a little bit worse, but again, you can see that it's it's really uh, very, very tight levels of inventory. Um, I brought the local data so that you haven't. Actually, we put these out on our website every month so you can download very localized stats and share them um, with your with your sphere. Do you use those? Or do you have a question? Yeah, so this is the number of transactions every month um, going back a few years to 2015, but only for transactions over a million dollars. So I just cut off everything under a million dollars and each uh, color is a different segment. Right. So the blue stuff is one to two million. The orange is two to three. Um, gray is three to four, et cetera. It's still above pandemic levels. Yeah. So if you go back to 2021, as an example, right, we were selling almost 10,000 properties over a million dollars per month. Um, now it's kind of in that 7,000 or so range. If you look at 2018, 19, it was in the kind of 5,000. Right. So we're still well above those pre pandemics. It's just not 10,000 a month the way that it was when there was 3% interest rates, but it's still 7,000, which is better than what we were used to doing month to month prior to the pandemic. And I'll make sure that actually, and I already sent these to Albert. So you guys will get a copy of these and all that stuff, I'm sure, uh, so that you can use these in, in those conversations. But you can download all of this stuff, but you can see just a very still um, inventory constrained market listings down anywhere from 40 to 60 percent even across most of the the san gabriel valley so it's hard to generate more than 16 transactions a month when there's 15 homes available for sale um you know that's just kind of math and why i say we need to make sure that we are not taking it for granted and keeping that kind of nose to the grindstone approach particularly in light of the macro economy and i want to just put a couple of risk factors on your radar. I'm still forecasting that the economy will grow next year. So again, we don't need to panic, but we need to make sure that we're taking it very serious because there are some challenges. Again, consumers are 70% of GDP, business investment, new construction, government, international trade, all that stuff is less than a third of the US economy. 70% is consumer spending. And we have savings rates that have gone from you know double digits when we were getting free money to now 0%. And increasingly, we've been fueling this rebound economically in the service sector, in particular bars, restaurants, hotels, uh, travel, et cetera, by putting it on the credit card. We got $150 billion more in credit card debt than we had before the pandemic. More of those credit cards are becoming delinquent. Still pretty low. Um, we're talking about you know 3% credit card delinquencies. It's not a huge number, but that's double where it was a year ago. Right. And so um, this doesn't have me panic that everybody's going to go bankrupt, but it does make me think that consumers are going to have to stop and catch their breath. Right. Eventually savings hit zero. Your credit card gets maxed out. And you realize like you bought one too many 80 inch TVs or whatever, and you have to kind of stop and catch your breath. I don't expect a big retrenchment where we're going to sell everything and start eating top ramen only and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I do think that we're going to press pause on some major purchases and cars um, and really wait for, for our kind of personal balance sheets to rebound a little bit. The reason why that's so important is, again, because not only are they 70 percent of the economy, they've been about 95 percent of all of the economic growth. So almost the entirety of this recovery since the pandemic has come from us out there buying stuff. And so that has me worried that the economy won't be as strong. All of our eggs are in that one basket. And if consumers pull back, it's not like businesses are out there investing in new equipment and building new plants and et cetera, et cetera, um, for us to kind of be more diversified. We're all in consumer spending. Second big risk that I think has um, will be challenging for those of us that work in commercial and do office transactions or office leases in particular, to a lesser extent retail, um, is that the commercial sector still got a lot of work ahead of it. Right. You can look at our two major employment centers, both here in L.A. and in San Francisco, and we're in the 20, 25 percent range, in some cases higher than that uh, sub market by sub market 
for office vacancies. And the office sector, and again, to a lesser extent, retail has a few key challenges ahead of it. Number one is that remote work is still a thing, right? And, and in some ways that 3.2 million worker shortage that I talked about before that's driving so much of this inflation is also preventing employers from being successful at getting everybody back to the office, right? When there's many more jobs than there are workers, workers are in the driver's seat in terms of making demands or rejecting demands to come back into the office. And so employers don't have that same appetite for office space that they used to have when it was every single person coming to the office every single day. Um, the other thing is, you know, so that's kind of uh, one of the big structural shifts that I think will be with us even after the pandemic until there's more um, unemployment, right? And workers don't feel as firmly in the driver's seat to make demands on employers. The other thing, is you know that that the economy is poised to be slower. So even if you do want to keep all of your existing office space, if you're not doing as well economically, um, you just don't have as much money coming in the front door to be able to afford to do that, right? And then the kind of third factor is that really there's no such thing as a 30-year fixed rate office loan, right? And so a lot of these this office debt is going to have to get re-upped, and it's going to happen at much higher rate. So even if you pass the first two tests, right, and everybody comes back to the office, you survive the economy and are still doing well, well, now you've got to pay a bunch more money to keep that office space going because your debt matured and you had to renew it at, again, much higher uh, rates. And I think this is going to be challenging for the commercial market in general. I also think it's an opportunity. It's going to generate a bunch of deals. You know, people aren't going to want to let this debt go belly up and they'll be willing to sell it for um, discounts and things like that. But it does have the potential to impact the broader economy. We've already seen a few bank failures and banks, regional, you know, mid and large size banks are the ones that own most of this kind of commercial office debt. And so if it spills over to them and it spills over to the financial markets, that's when we would see it show back up in residential real estate through that wealth effect, right? If people feel poor because the stock market just tanked because of a bunch of bad commercial debt, they wouldn't be out buying as many $3 million properties, uh, et cetera, right? And so that's the second big risk. And you can see CMBS delinquencies, particularly for office, but a little bit for uh, retail as well. We're still pretty much buying stuff on our phones, on the couch and sweatpants and not going to the mall anymore. Um, are, have almost doubled by this point in time. So um, that is is kind of the two biggest macro risks on top of that. I think especially um, in markets like this, we're gonna have insurance issues that are gonna be ongoing, right? So not only do you have these effects on buyer demand and stuff, 17% um, of all the realtors that we surveyed this year, we talked to about three to 5,000, I think 3,500 for this particular one, um, had difficulty with their transaction due to insurance issues, right? It was either um, not available, couldn't find a carrier, the premium was too high, um, fair plan in some communities is like the only game in town and the market share of fair overall is like gone from basically nothing to 4% of the entire statewide market. In some communities, it's a huge chunk of the overall market. And it's not just in rural areas. We're seeing even in cities and things like that, costs are going up, availability, is becoming more constrained. And this is just another uh, wild card that I think kind of boils down to more expensive insurance, right? No matter what we're looking at, all these different scenarios, ways to keep the carriers from leaving, um, all basically involve higher insurance costs, right? The only way we get, you know, the all states and the state farms and all that stuff to keep writing policies here is to let them pass on their reinsurance costs. Those are the biggest solutions that I hear being talked about in Congress. And that will keep all state here, but it'll just mean they're charging rates and premiums that look similar to what you get on the fair plan, right? So I don't think anything, um, and I think so this is still very much playing out. Again, this is an area where consumers really, really need it. CAR has a legal hotline that you can call and get free legal advice from like some of the best attorneys that are out there. And they've told horror stories about agents and customers, buyers that don't um, do their due diligence in time, right? And you um, wait till the 11th hour and release all your investigation contingencies and things like that, get written a huge insurance premium that you can't afford now 
and lose your EMD. And so then you have these transactions where we're already in a low transaction environment where these people just lost their life savings and go from being able to become homeowners to not. And again, why I, you know, I'm still optimistic because they need that really, um, that expertise to make sure that they avoid making a huge mistake. These are very high stakes transactions, especially in markets like this when prices are so um, high, which kind of brings me to what, you know, we need to be telling buyers and sellers is, you know, and, and what we need to be prepared for as professionals moving forward is, you know, the inventory stuff I don't think is going to go away over the short run. So this is a pie chart over time. So each slice is an individual pie chart for each quarter uh, here in California, but it represents the mortgage pool in California broken down by what interest rate those homeowners actually have. And if you look at the blue stuff, the very top that represents people with a 6% interest rate or higher. 93% of people in California have under a 6% mortgage. And so with rates at seven and a half, eight percent you face a huge financial penalty for selling that house and moving, right? Like even um, those of us that are like getting divorced or finding a way to like keep the house going, right? Because you're in like the, actually Lawrence Yoon, if you know NAR's chief economist said, he projects divorce rates are actually going to start coming down in the next few years because no matter how bad you hate your spouse, you love your mortgage. You're going to uh, try and keep that going. I disagree, but um, but I do think it speaks to this idea of this kind of underlying lock-in effect of hyper-low interest rates, right? Where again, you saw what happened when you go from a 3% to a 7% rate on that purchasing power calculator. You could run that analysis in the opposite direction and see what it does to your monthly mortgage payment, right? Like I could sell my house for a million bucks. I'm gonna go buy something for 600 if I can even find a $600,000 home in the first place, but then my payment's gonna be like a thousand bucks a month more than it is on my million dollar home. And I'm gonna be like for this crummy house, right? So I've got like million dollar taste on a $600,000 um, budget. And that is again, buyers need to be prepared for inventory to stay tight, meaning that prices will continue to go up. Rates are gonna stay high there's a cost of waiting. So you can use that purchasing power calculator. That being said, and I know that two thirds of folks actually, you know, the, the stuff at the bottom, two thirds, the orange and the dark blue stuff is people under 4%. It's gonna be really hard to get those people to move, but that still leaves about a third of the market that's over 4%, somewhere four, five, six percent something like that. People that took out arm loans during the, the boom times and things like that. For those folks, it doesn't take rates coming down too far to be able to unlock at least some of that stuff, right? If you're in a five and a half percent rate, rates come down to six and a half or so, you're not making that big of a sacrifice uh, by moving. And so there is, and that is probably one of the primary reasons why we do see some more inventory starting to come online um, next year. A lot of people are locked in, but you will get some people at the margins that have lots of credit card debt and go, look, I'm going to cash in this equity. I don't want to do a 10% key lock, whatever. Um, and you will see some of those transactions start to come back. But if your brother-in-law told you there's a flood of, you know, REOs or otherwise coming onto the market, people are holding on to these homes for dear life, even when they've kind of got that metaphorical gun to their head through divorce or death or something like that, um, because they're in this kind of once in a lifetime financial kind of a deal. But, you know, again, the, the numbers show that people are li living in these homes longer than ever, right? Last year was an, or, or excuse me, this year was an all time high in the 30 plus years that we've been doing this survey for how long you lived in that house before you sold it. It went to a median of 12 years. So that means 50% of people that sold lived in their house for longer than 12 years. Uh, and again, all of these various kind of headwinds for getting supply online. As much as I think that supply will be the limiting factor, though, I do think that we need to start kind of alerting sellers at the front end in our listing presentations that the market has changed a lot as rates have really shot up over the last two months, two, three months. And you can see that that the purchase applications are way below where they have been uh, up to this point in time, right? We're way below where we were last year when rates were starting to really rise rapidly. And the, the yellow stuff is this year. Each one of these lines is like mortgage applications year by year through each week of the year. And we're coming in well below where we were even at the end of last year when we hit those kind of all time low levels. And that's important for sellers to understand, right? I can tell you as somebody who's been incredibly personally disappointed, um, and I'm somebody who actually stares at these numbers every day as a job, 
Um, it's painful when your when your you know agent tells you to lower the price, right? You really do. That was money that may have only existed on paper, but to me, it felt very real. And I like already had my boat like added to my card online and all that stuff. And um, but if you look at the dynamics as demand is pulled back in the face of these higher rates, it's still an amazing time to sell a house, right? So this is weekly data um, going right up through last weekend, and you can see the median days on market last week. Uh, was still 19 days, less than three weeks. Homes are still selling pretty quick. But if you look at the trend line over the last two to three months, right, those last 12 or 15 bars or so, they're consistently trending up, right? And so um, it's a great time to sell a home, but we're not in that kind of white hot market that we were back when rates were still at 3%. And you might be having to do a little bit more on the sell side than we've had to up to this point, right? Again, that kind of idea that people have that $1.3 million taste still, and they're used to looking at houses up at that price point, they can still qualify and buy something at 850 or 900,000, but they want it to look good, right? And they're more picking it because they're used to looking at $1.3 million homes. And so that means that we've got to be ready to go. Not only do we have to like price it strategically, which is something that we haven't really had to worry about that much over the last couple of years, um, but you got to have it staged. You got to have killer pictures. You got to maybe spend some more money um, doing that pre-listing stuff of fixing it up or painting and all that stuff that sellers really hate to outlay money when they're trying to sell a house, but you might need to do it um, in an environment where that buyer pool has shrunk quite a bit. Still a phenomenal time. You're still going to sell it quick. Um, but, you know, again, when you're like really intransigent, when your realtor calls and says, you know, we've got to um, lower down the price, the reality is that one out of three active listings on the market last week had reduced price, right? So I can go, I'm not giving up my boat. I will not, you know, delete that out of my cart online or whatever. Um, but one out of three other sellers has done a price reduction up to this point. Um, and so, again, it's not a lot, right? You're talking about two thirds of the market not having to reduce. The ones that are priced right are selling. They're selling quick. Um, and actually, if you look at the over list price closings, it was still about 42 out of five, a little better than two out of five uh, last week. So if it's priced right, it looks good, still sells quick, and you can actually still sell it uh, above list. But again, if you look at the trend line on all of these different measures of competitiveness, the market's getting less competitive as we go on. That's also a huge opportunity for buyers, right? Because sellers are more willing to do stuff that they weren't willing to do a year or two ago. They will make a price concession. They will consider a you know temporary or permanent rate buy down or closing costs or free rent backs or um, other stuff that wouldn't have been on the table back when rates were at 3%. So again, I think it's incumbent on us to get folks focused on what really matters. That is home ownership, right? We need to generate more guys like my dad who have nerdy kids that go on to reap all the benefits of home ownership that are um, very clearly documented. This is my favorite economic journal article in life. If you only ever read one economic study in your life, read this one. Um, it's all about how renting doesn't make you better off. And they did this in 2013, even after the financial crisis and prices went down a bunch and all of that, even with those declines, they found that home ownership is still the one and only way that people get better uh, in life. And actually, two weeks ago, the Fed released its 2022 survey of consumer finance. And this is my favorite chart in the entire world. If you look at the $192,000 of net worth the typical U.S. household has, and then you further break that down between renters and owners, it backs up that Harvard study, right? Homeowners are the only ones that have accumulated any wealth in this country. 2022's data in real terms, after you take the inflation out, uh, renters were only 900 bucks better off in 2022 than they were back in 1995, right? So you can come up with a hypothetical study on paper that says, oh, if I take that difference between my rent, my mortgage, and I just invest that and do all this fancy whiz bang stuff and buy Bitcoin and whatever else, um, I'll end up just as well off as if I would have bought a house. The actual data shows that that never happens, right? That you don't end up doing all this whiz bang financial stuff and making all these smart moves on financial markets. You end up consuming more, right? You live in a fancier apartment. You drive a fancier car. I even saw you could do like a three-year loan for rims on that car now right? And people are doing all of that stuff. You don't ever end up going on to accumulate any actual wealth. The proof is in the pudding. 
that's what you should be focused on as a buyer, not what happens to the market and when is the exact right moment. The right moments when you're ready to buy it. When you get married, when you have a baby, when you're sick of living in your apartment, right? Like prices over the long term only ever go one way, and that is undiminished by um, you know the current economic fluctuations. The market goes up and down all the time. Long run only ever goes up. Uh, second thing, kind of against your brother-in-law's mathematics abilities, right, is that I just do not think we have the ingredients for a foreclosure crisis and for major declines in home prices. A, a lot of people are locked in and holding on to those homes no matter what. B, the vast majority of those people are actually on time on their mortgage payments. Most, most people out there are in fixed rate mortgages. They don't have payments that are shooting through the roof and indeed through the second quarter of this year, a little bit less than 98% of uh, mortgages in California are being paid on time. So you don't throw the keys back to the bank on a house that you're current on the monthly mortgage payment, on, right? So that's like strike one against your brother-in-law's email newsletter campaign. Strike two is, is that the vast majority of people, and we have a higher percentage of people with home equity, and the amount of home equity is already almost back to all-time high levels. So not only is my payment being made on time and I'm not behind on any payments, I also have a house that's worth more than what I owe on it, and that's true in the vast majority of the cases, and you don't walk away from a home that you could sell for a profit, right? Even if you lose your job, you just sell that house, put that money in the bank, wait till you get a better job, do something else in housing, et cetera. That's kind of strike two. And then strike three, and, and we saw this in the local market actually going a little bit stronger even than what you see in the statewide number, but that is that prices are still going up and have gone up throughout almost the entirety of this year. They went down from August to September. That's the spring home buying season, right? That on a year to year basis, Prices in September were actually higher than they were last September. Um, and that kind of captures for that seasonal effect. And even on a month to month basis, they were going up almost every single month in 2023. You don't walk away from an appreciating asset either, right? So I just don't see that's without even getting into all the minutia of mortgage market and underwriting standards and the fact that people are in fixed rate loans, with money down. I FICOs, all of that kind of stuff. It's just a different ball of wax than where we were back in 2004, 5, 6, when everybody had a 5 1 option or mega amp loan resets, blows up in your face, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, last thing is, you know, again, don't take that shotgun approach. Consider working with buyers again. I know it's a pain, it's very rewarding. But, and it's also, I think, again, smart business strategy because even though the overall pie is smaller, buyers aren't as bogged down in where rates are compared to where they were a year ago when we were incredibly spoiled and you got to spend a lot of gas money and time and whatever driving them around um, but they are i think a little bit in in better position to kind of be undaunted by by the current level of rates the other thing is you know focus on those vacation second home markets the high income earners all cash sales were also up investor sales were also up um, Albert told me I only had an hour, so I didn't bring like all 500 of the charts that I wanted to show you. Um, but, you know, the point being is that even though, you know, don't focus on the size of the pie being smaller, focus in on the segments that are still growing, even as, uh, you know, others are falling off, right? Even though those kind of um, resale transactions may be drying up a little bit, you still got first time buyers, 82% of the consumers that we surveyed renters this year still wanted home ownership. That was near an all time high level. Um, it's just a question of being able to make it happen. And again, with rate buy downs and other stuff and being having somebody that knows how to negotiate on their behalf and bring all their bag of tricks to bear, I think is the recipe for success. The other thing, is to respond to our red alerts and make your voice heard and stuff like that. Because again, policy can make a big difference. I went through the census data and looked at all households in California, whether they were married, when they bought their house, how much they paid, how much it's worth now. Um, and if you do that calculation, it's really scary. 2.7 million or so of our six, 7 million households here, single family owner occupied households in California would be above that capital gains threshold if they were to sell. So not only do you, are we asking them to move in a market where there's no homes to move into, where you're gonna lose your killer interest rate, maybe lose your property tax, um, but now you're gonna face this big capital gains penalty on top of that. If they do raise it, and there's some bill floating around from my Congressman, Jamie Panetta up on the Central Coast in Congress, 
and it's called it has a super clunky name i think it's called like more homes available for sale on the market act or something like that but it would raise that capital gains threshold double it and index it to inflation and if you recrunch this analysis um, using those higher thresholds the number of people locked in drops from 2.7 million homes to just a little over a million homes that's a difference of 1.6 or so million not all those people obviously are going to move but even if five ten percent of them do move you're talking about 80 160,000 units that could potentially start to come back onto the market so um you know macro environments challenging we don't want to make it even more challenging um, with self-inflicted wounds and bad policy so let's try and get some of that fixed too again we still have the economy growing even with all of these headwinds it's just not going to be the six uh percent that we saw in 2021 or even the two or three percent that we're going to see over the last couple of years it will be less tepid growth we think that unemployment will go up a little bit so those jobs won't be quite as abundant and we think that you know ultimately it's going to be a slow burn for rates to come down and we'll probably still be in the high sixes maybe mid sixes um late next year probably best case is low sixes I would say meaning that you know you're not going to be saving a bunch of money and as rates hit six percent all that's going to happen is the buyers are going to come back so again first best time to buy a home is 20 years ago second best time today um that's because we're a state that's gone from 25 to 40 million people and slash the amount of new construction that we do every year meaning that prices again over the long term only ever go one way and that's up and we even have prices continuing their upward trajectory next year with a six percent increase so um you know again I think those of us that really embrace that role as the trusted advisor and market expert will do um, really well. And I'm optimistic because consumers still need us, regardless of what's happening on the industry front or with all these legal cases and things like that. Um, the recipe for success is to add value to consumers. And that's how we kind of address all of these various challenges out there. And, and if you do that, you won't just survive, you'll thrive. Um, and so I will leave it there and say thank you to Ling Chao and Albert for having me. And for those who want to see the, the slide, it usually is on CL.org. Yeah, it's on the Albert Yeah, if you're interested, uh, go to CL.org. There's a lot of information there. And also, uh, if you still want it, you can't find it, talk to our staff. Maybe we can email it to you. Okay. Thank you so much for your time today. Like I said, we, you know, he's very popular at CAR. <laughs> so when we when we see you, we have to surround you. <laughs> I work for you guys. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Art Carter from CAR, not CAR, CMS. Um, I where is he? Oh, over there. Uh, I know Mr. Carter when I was young and naive, and. Uh, Gosh, it's been almost 20 years, almost, oh no, 15 or 15 years. I was very young at that time. Uh, and I, I'm still very young. <laughs> I'm still very young. Um, I was uh, I was uh, a, a director at that time at CRMS before they went statewide. And at that time, I remember our says, we're going to statewide. We're going to move to statewide. And you know what? That guy did it. Okay. He put uh, CRMS into California State One is now one of the largest uh, CRMS multiple, multiple listing data services in the United States. So how many members do we have right now? We have over 100,000 members. So that's from a uh, very small. I remember at that time was like, and I think was very petite at that time. And we grow so fast. And that is all because of uh, Mr. R. Carter that lead the CARMLs to the right way. And of course, uh, he never remembers that I like Coca-Cola. He always give me Pepsi. I don't know why. I still cannot figure that today. After many years, I'm still a Coke girl and he's still a Pepsi guy, but he tells me he doesn't drink soda anymore, but I don't know if that's true. So let's please welcome Mr. R. Carter. Uh, uh, obviously, she came into the back and she handed me a bio and said, uh, do you want me to read this? And I said, you've never followed instructions since the day I met you. So uh, I fully expected uh, what I got at first, so uh, we're, we're just going to have time. Wow.
There's a lot of stuff going on. A lot of stuff going on. So, you know, I started this in 2005, so over 18 years ago. I used to have some expectations of technology and with everything going on in AR, the rules, and, you know, even from a legal standpoint, lawsuits were unheard of at that point. Uh, that is not the case. And, it, you know, back then, you know, changes that came, uh, you know, every month, every other month, you know, that would be, you know, that would be a, a life-changing event for a program. Take this in with a grain of salt. Um, realtors have an extra anti-change gene in their makeup. Uh, you guys don't like change. Um, and unfortunately, change is going to be the hallmark for 2023 and 2024. Uh, to the point where it will change the way you guys do business in an extensive way. So I'm going to get into all of that. You know, literally things are changing hourly. I will probably go back to my phone after uh, speaking here today and probably have a couple of updates that may have changed things uh, during the time that I'm speaking. So with that, I am going to uh, going to talk, uh, dive into the, the slides here. Um, you know, I, my apologies for the camera and the people you guys are watching on are watching online. You're more you're more uh, apt to watch the slides than uh, look at me in place. So we're going to go over a number of different things. I'm not going to dive too much into it because Jordan already did this uh, from a market statistic standpoint. But mine is more a footprint for the West San Diego uh, Board of Realtors Association of Realtors. I won't have this die hard. Sorry. Uh, and then get into some of the statistics. Uh, that we're seeing, especially you know, from a brokerage standpoint, you guys, you guys have an idea of the issues that we're seeing out in the marketplace with your agents who are calling in, uh, and then just talk about our philosophy and what we're doing long term for you as brokers uh, that subscribe to our services. We do have over 100,000 subscribers. The marketplace has changed, and we'll get into some of those things as we move along. But overall, we're going to be CRMLS footprint and recognize that CRMLS goes from Northern California. You guys know where Red Bluff is. Some of you probably know where Red Bluff is. We go all the way from Red Bluff down to the San Diego uh, Mexican border. So that is the overall footprint for CRMLS. Uh, I like to, you know, like to say that we have a statewide, uh, but we don't uh, specifically at this point because. They're just, I know, a lot of different things that are happening from a political standpoint. Our goal at the TRMLS level is to give you access to 100% of the listing in the state of California. It is a brokerage decision where agents do business. It shouldn't be an MLS and association decision. So we're in the process of doing as many of those things as we possibly can to get those things to you. Obviously, you know, Jordan's already, you know, wowed you guys with 150 slides that showed you that the marketplace is not doing well lately. Uh, it has been into a dramatic shift over the last year, especially as interest rates have dramatically changed the equation. Uh, overall, within the CRMLS system, you've seen a drop of 17% in new listings, 15% in active listings, uh, almost 21% in pending sales. And this is year over year. Uh, we're looking at uh, um, end of September. I don't have the October numbers, but these are the end of September uh, numbers. Closed sales are down 24%, 32% uh, and closed volume is down. Obviously, one of the things that we started tracking a little bit more religiously over the last couple of years is especially with the attachment we have with our showing services and with lockbox openings. Uh, we're seeing, you know, an extended amount of uh, time on every day on market. You guys, you guys can see that, that that indicator keeps on ticking up. So you guys are seeing that. Um, Mark, you know, the houses are staying on the, the market a lot longer than they were before. Uh, but one of the things that we're going to be doing that I'm going to talk about a little bit later is kind of give you guys some of the statistics to be able to share with your partners on a real time basis, such as shows per listing and how many times a lockbox has been open. And that's going to give you some historical, you know, idea of what we're seeing across the board uh, and especially what different marketplaces do in regards to. You know how many how many lockbox openings does it take to get to a closed sale in a, in a certain ge uh, geographical area? How many showings does it typically take to get to a sale? Uh, how how is your how is your house that you have uh, on the market compared to other properties that are in the same marketplace? Those are some of the statistics that we're going to be giving you 
uh, going forward, we'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, specifically, you guys kind of, kind of near, but with some significant changes. Your active listings are actually down uh, less than the footprint across CRMLS. Um, your pending sales are down less. Uh, closed sales are about uh, on target. Uh, closed volume, uh, kind of the, the same idea. Shows per listing is actually down uh, from the CRMLS average. And then your average case on market is not about as much as the, the total. So a little bit healthier <laughs> of a market within the, the same thing that I than what we're seeing across the whole entire footprint of CMLS. So not all bad news. Um, and hopefully uh, the middle part of my presentation will be good news for you guys. And then uh, I'm going to send them to lunch on a downer. So I, I will warn you guys about that right now. So uh, CMLS membership is dropping. Um, some of you guys may view that as a good thing, some of you may view it as a bad thing, but we have lost about 5% of our membership uh, year over year. And what we're seeing across the footprint um, is depending upon the marketplace, you know, uh, the worst case, a 30 to 40% increase in gross sales at the average broker's office. Okay, so that is pretty significant across the board. And we're seeing some hard times coming for. Uh, some of the, the brokerage offices that we've been tracking across across the, the footprint, and uh, we're going to continue to give you guys as much of that information as we possibly can. So, as I said, you guys have access to about 70% of the listings in the state of California right now. And you guys can see the, uh, the graphical display of all the areas that you have. Uh, the darker blue are the ones that are participating with CRMLS. The uh, lighter blue, the two, are data shares and reciprocal access. And so when I say you guys have access to it, it means to the vast majority of this, you guys have access to those listings within the matrix platform. Okay, you can search across any of those areas, even into the, the central coast within uh, the CRMLS footprint and be able to have those search results returned within, within the matrix platform. So if you have a client that is maybe moving out of area and you just want to help them find uh, somebody in a marketplace that they be moving into in the state of California, uh, you guys have access to those pieces. The one that's not on here is if you're developing relationships with MLS across the country, uh, including into uh, Arizona and Las Vegas, where you guys are going to be able to have views of those properties in Las Vegas, into Arizona, you've already signed agreements in Miami and Fort Lauderdale, and also into Atlanta. So, in as much as we possibly can, and guys, we know that you guys are in a relationship business. We're going to do everything we possibly can for you guys to be able to keep those relationships alive, no matter where your, your clients may be moving. So, it's important for you, and it's important for us as well. Uh, you guys can see the the next. It's kind of hard to tell what that is at the bottom, but that is Mexico. You guys do have access to listings across the whole base of Mexico as well. Recognize when I talk about MLS is outside of, outside the state of California, you are not licensed to sell in those areas unless you are licensed to sell in those areas. But you need to have a license to sell in those areas, including Mexico. But having access to that information and being able to talk to your clients about what may be available at some of the global resort markets like Cabo and Cancun and Puerto Vallarta, even you know those that might be looking across the border into Tijuana and to Ensenada, you guys have access to that information through the Matrix platform. It is a link within the outside links in the Matrix system, and you guys can go directly into those platforms and look for properties down there. It's kind of interesting. Yes, are there any plans to change Texas at all? Because major markets are California, Texas, or there. I'm, I'm having discussions, um, especially in the Dallas market right now, but no movement at this point. Um, it's going to be more of the, the same thing where you would actually log into their matrix system. So that's the one thing that we are working on. But yes, there are some discussions happening along these lines. Okay. Is there another question? Okay. Let's move on into some of the statistics we're seeing, especially on the support side. Um, you guys are unique. Um, we, as, as, based on your size, we hear from your members far more than we do from other associations. And that's a great thing. That's what we're there for. 70% of the calls we get into our call center are training in nature. Okay? 
So I think it's important you guys know there's a training slide a little bit later that we'll talk about that. Um, you guys rely on the phone to get your training a lot more than you rely on trainers coming out to your office. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those opportunities as we move forward. Um, how many of you guys love rules, love compliance? I, I have a couple of fans here. Um, recognize that what we do at the MLS level is such a big benefit to brokers and agents and to the consumer. Realize that for every violation, every single violation that goes out, we, re we receive nine complaints about that listing. Okay? So it is a nine to one margin of people who are complaining about a certain listing being uh, behaving a certain way or an agent behaving a certain way than any uh, compliance issue that's, that's put out for that. You guys can see, you know, the vast majority of what we're seeing um, is is not violated. It's not a, a violation in the multiple listing service. You guys correct them, and you guys listen to them. Anything I can tell you is have an email address on file with West San Gabriel and with CRMLS that you pay attention to. The excuse we get all the time is, well, I don't pay attention to that email box, or I never got the email. Pay attention to what's going out, because the vast majority of time, the citations are unnecessary, because you didn't pay attention, your agents didn't pay attention to what was going on uh, in their email inboxes, okay? Just flat out, that would take care of probably half of those violations that you're seeing there. And it is important for those things to occur. Uh, recognize that when CMLS, you put a listing into the CMLS system, it goes out on over 30,000 websites within 15 minutes. And we're still seeing things like children home alone after 3 p.m. in public remarks. Now we go in and take those things out, but home vacant, those are just huge security risks across the board. We're still seeing a lot of that stuff. I just think that people aren't really paying attention or, or understanding the extent of what you're listing and where your listing goes including the multiple listing service, okay? Education statistics, I'm just gonna say this. If you put 15 people in front of one of our trainers, we'll put a trainer in front of you, okay? It is such a huge benefit to you and I know that you guys are well aware of the trainers that we have uh, that are coming out to your offices. And so please reach out to us um, if you have an interest in having uh, somebody come out to your office to do some of those educational uh, situations. I'm going to shift a little bit into our philosophy and just kind of tell you guys of where we're going. Um, we are moving more into a situation of managing and owning our own pro property technology. And the reason why we're doing that is we've heard a lot of the from our brokers and our agents that you're not necessarily happy with the technology that we're providing to you being owned by people that you don't feel comfortable with. Obviously, there's a lot of information that goes into the MLS system, a lot of information um, from a timeliness standpoint that could you know, be into a, a situation where if it was used in the wrong way, could give somebody a, a leg up on what it is that you're doing. So CRMLS has took it on over the last three to four years to start developing and delivering our own technology. And you guys are seeing some of the, the outlays of what it is that we're trying to do on that side. Uh, the first one, uh, first one that we put out there. Yes. Sorry, there's a Zoom request. If you could just speak close. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Zoom requests. <laughs> <laughs> Words that were not in anybody's vocabulary until years ago. So, uh, you know, I had an all staff meeting yesterday, and for whatever reason, my Zoom decided not to work uh, during the beginning of the, the meeting. It was almost like I had never been on Zoom before. So, my apologies for those of you guys uh, on, on uh, camera, and uh, I will try to not move around as much either. So, Ari Center Hub is one of the first things that you guys have seen out of us. And this is a product that is owned and delivered by CRMLS Technology. 
And the reason why we did that is because increasingly we are in a situation where vendors are not being responsive to what we want to do with the technology. And I talked a little bit earlier about being able to deliver information to you guys statistically. Most of the vendors out there, unless it's very broad-based information, don't want to deliver that through the platforms that we were providing out to you. Above and beyond them being owned by people that we don't, we don't necessarily agree with having ownership in, above and beyond that, we just were having a lack of movement whatsoever in the technology staying fresh, the technology delivering information that was meaningful to our brokers and our agents. So RE Center Hub is kind of the first step, and it literally is everything that CRMLS is doing will be hung off of RE Center Hub. All the information, uh, all of the tax information that we've gone out and curated, and we're going to talk about that and some of the additional product lines you guys are going to see coming out. We are moving to what's called a property-centric model. Most MLSs, all they care about are the listings that are input into the system. That's what their database is, just the listings that are input into the system. CRMLS will be transitioning into a, a full database of all records for every property, commercial and residential, that you guys will be able to search in all of the platforms moving forward. And we're doing some things, I've gotten yelled at in presentations about some of the things that we're talking about doing. And obviously, we have an operations committee that's going to be looking at a lot of what we're doing. But as I get into the lawsuits a little bit later, the thing that this industry has been uh, complaining about for forever and that the government is keying in on right now is there's an unwillingness for transparency in between, in their opinion, in between the real estate industry and the consumer. And so what we're talking about is trying to increase those, those levels of transparency. Imagine a database that you can go into and see how it was marketed in his past lives, uh, last past listing. See what disclosures were placed on that property in his past. See all the information from a tax record standpoint in one place. We're doing a lot of stuff to try to give you guys as much information as you possibly can to where you and your agents don't have to get on a phone call with the title company and have them pull reports to give you information that may not be included in multiple listings. We're looking to give you guys everything that you can get in those reports plus more. Okay? And it's a big, big ask from a technology standpoint, from a database standpoint. But we are we're four years into this process of going there. And over the next six months, you're going to see some pretty significant offerings and changes as we move along. And so let's dump into that. Uh, InfoSparks is something that I'm going to push you guys back towards. You know, Jordan has been talking about going to the CAR website and downloading reports out of CAR. Those are stale. Um, InfoSparks is probably the most up-to-date up stats you're going to be able to get out of the multiple listing service and being able to really look at those pieces of information and dive into some of the the micro market situations that you're dealing with to be able to talk to your sellers. So, InfoSparks, you guys all pay West St. Gabriel for your MLS service. All of these things that I'm talking about are at no additional cost. So, it's already included. And I think that, that one of the things that we really want to do is kind of drive some of the adoption because we're, we're, we're probably spending a lot of money in this industry on things that we really don't need to. And CRMLS is working hard to kind of change that. Uh, so, coming soon for our matrix users, it's already launched in our Paragon and Flex platforms, is Local Logic. And Local Logic is an intelligence provider that quantifies location at a scale to shape smarter developments for sustainable cities. And it provides also current CMLS users with really localized data points, uh, demographics, location scores, local neighborhood profiles, points of interest, and school data, and across all of the different areas that you might be doing a business, okay? And that platform will be integrated into everything you're doing on the matrix side and into real list tax, okay? Above and beyond what's already there. And it will be searchable within the matrix platform as we move along. Cuba Casa, floor plans, 
Hopefully you guys have availed yourself of this already. You guys do get a free floor plan. Uh, all you gotta do is on your cell phone, download an app, both uh, Google or both uh, Android and iPhones. And basically you walk around the house. It doesn't take very long. And within 24 hours, they'll deliver you, deliver you a floor plan that is better than, it's within 10% of the actual square footage. But, you know, those square footages aren't going to be published on the MLS. You are going to be able to publish those floor plans in the multiple listing service and have it included across the board. Okay? Uh, that is available. It's available now. You just announced it earlier this week. You guys all read the, the, uh, the little eye dates that come up. You're lying to me, but it's okay. But please, please, as we move forward, because there's so many changes coming up, please take advantage of reading some of those things. We know in Matrix that it's 24 seconds in between the time you log in and click on it like this. And I'm pretty sure that you guys are not all speed readers to that one. So, so that if somebody can go into the general automatically, it is on there. It is it is on it is it is on the on the, the dashboard map. Yeah. Devin's writing that down. We'll get you some, some information on that. Okay. Welcome map is coming as well. One of the things that we got a lot of requests about is the ability to host videos on the MLS platform. It's not as big of a violation as it was in the past, but those branded videos have always been an issue. And branded meaning you've got your you know, company name or your agent's name branded on the videos. And even you know some of the, the providers brand their information on those videos as well. That is a no-no for the rules. Welcome Matt will be giving you the ability to upload all of your videos into the platform. It's a really, really cool uh, platform to be able to use. It's going to give you a ton of analytics, especially how many times your videos were viewed out on all of the IDX websites, out on all of the different third-party providers, uh, portals, along those lines. It's going to give you a lot more analytics than you guys get at this point. Does Welcome Matt uh, allow agent videos as well, or is it just to be used? It is just property videos at this point. Okay. Recognize that agent videos you can't upload into the system um, for obvious reasons. There's there's a, a lot of I, I've gotten into the arguments on podcasts with people on, on stuff like this, but you know, obviously the fact that it goes out to those 25,000 IDX websites, uh, nobody wants another agent's uh, video on their website selling another agent's services. So that's one of the primary reasons why we do that. So uh, reimaginehome.ai. I'm not going to go into this too much in depth because I want to spend the rest of my time on the lawsuits. Reimaginehome.ai. Go there. Um, it is a it is a very cool product. It is virtual staging for your listings. Uh, it is cool because you can take all of the photos from the mobile listing service, upload them into uh, reimaginehome.ai. It will strip all the furniture out of it in a very photorealistic way and give you the ability to put whatever furniture you want into it. Longer term, we're working on the platform to give you the ability to have a homeowner take pictures of their current house and click on a button and have the furniture that's in their current house moved into a listing they might be interested in. So it's kind of a cool product in a, in a different way that AI is going to be changing the industry. Yes. There is uh, no payment on the reimagined home for, I believe, up to, to 10 photos. Uh, but if you're going to be inputting into the MLS, then yes, you've got to do that because there needs to be some verbiage placed on, on it by uh, reimagined home. But just to play around with it, no, there's no cost to it. You can go to it right now. Deep, deep, deep breaths. <laughs> The question was, is AI going to take over agents' work? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, there's not any scenario that I can see. And I'm, you know, 
personally and you know the company that you know CMLS and our venture MLS SI are invested in a couple of different AI functionalities. No. Um, the the it's not necessarily that the complexity of what you're doing can't be enhanced by, by AI or taken over uh, to a certain extent, but that human touch of hand holding somebody through a transaction, AI is never going to get there. Um, it's 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 going to be a huge difficulty for AI to perform a lot of those functions. Obviously, the human factor of what you guys do, AI is not going to be able to replace. But if you think that just like you know the portals, the portals took this whole entire concept of finding a home for your clients. You guys don't do that anymore. You know, for the most part, they're finding stuff on their own. They're looking, they're investigating, they're doing all of their searches on their own. So AI is going to do some of those things where it will take over some of those aspects of things that that really don't make you a lot of money. They are time gains. So I don't I don't have a belief that that it's not going to change real estate. It absolutely will change real estate, but to take over an agent brokerage business. I don't see that occurring just because of the complexity and the human factor of what you guys do on a day to day basis. So that's that's my take on it. Uh, legal update. Um, here's the big one. How many of you guys have, have heard of the Sitzer Burnett case in Missouri? More of you guys should be raising your hands. Uh, this is a big, huge deal. Uh, it is a seller side claim. That it was filed in Missouri about two years ago, two and a half years ago. It has moved very quickly for an antitrust claim. It was filed in Missouri that it certified the class, which was everybody who bought and sold a home over the last five, well, over a five year period from 2021 back to 2016. And the trial began on 10 16 and has already ended. It was a jury trial. It was a jury of six individuals who, because of the complexities of this case, were not allowed to be homeowners. And what they were alleging is that sellers had overpaid by billions of dollars because they had to offer buying office compensation within the multiple listing service. There is a mandatory rule in, in the the uh, MLS system that NAR uh, requires us to, to submit to that if you're going to input a listing into the multiple listing service, you have to provide at least some compensation. One dollar has always been good enough. And so those are some of the arguments that NAR tried to make during the trial. Uh, they lost. They came back earlier this week. The jury deliberated for an hour and a half. That's it. After a two week trial. And came back with damages of $1.8 billion to the, the uh, plaintiffs in the case. And in an antitrust case, they treble that, they triple. So NAR and the remaining two uh, defendants, because anywhere real estate and Remax settled prior to the trial uh, going forward. So Berkshire Hathaway, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Keller Williams, and NAR are on the hook for $5.4 billion in the Missouri case. Okay. Obviously, NAR is going to appeal. There were a number of decisions that the judge made in this case that were of questionable nature. Um, and so they have some grounds to appeal on. But this most likely will be moving forward as we as we uh, kind of try to figure out what this means to the industry. I'm going to go into depth about what the plaintiff's attorneys want because it's also what the Department of Justice wants. Morrell versus NAR, any fair Keller Williams Remax Home Services, anywhere in the Remax has settled this case as well. This trial is most likely to occur in 2024. It is not a jury trial, okay? It is being held in front of a judge. A judge will make the decision on this one. And most likely we'll, we'll see 
maybe have a different fact pattern and a different uh, decision uh, coming out of this Morel case. This is in 20 MLS markets across the country. None of the MLSs in California have been sued in any of these, okay? So none of this affects from a, from a settlement standpoint anybody in California, so to speak. Um, like I said, the trial will be in 2024. Remax and anywhere have already settled on this one. This is a 13 to 15 billion dollar case prior to being trouble. So if any are Keller Williams, Berkshire Hathaway use this one, it could be a huge, huge dollar amount. The no select case in uh, in Boston, they're in the process of trying to settle this one. But it's important to note that. MLS Penn, which was the MLS in this case, NER was not named in this, this lawsuit. Same claims. Morell and No Select are the same claims that SIPs are made. Department of Justice has come back and said that the settlement doesn't meet what they want out of the real estate industry, which at this point, I kind of need to dive into what does the Department of Justice want out of the real estate industry. In 2018, I actually testified in front of this group. Um, they held a joint workshop on competition in real estate in Washington, D.C. It was interesting. Um, I went through about a month of being interviewed by upwards of 10 attorneys at a time preparing for this, for this, uh, this, this meeting, this uh, workshop. I will tell you that what the Department of Justice doesn't understand about what you guys do in real estate was pretty telling. And see that this occurred in 2018. There were there's things that have occurred since then that has changed the dynamic inside the Department of Justice. In summer of 2018, after this workshop, they did open an investigation of NAR MLS rules. And in 2020, uh, the Department of Justice and NAR settled on the investigation on commission and CCP rules. What occurred is that there was a change of administrations in between the agreement, the consent decree between the National Association of Realtors and the Department of Justice. Uh, the Biden administration took over in January of 2021, and in May of 2021, the Department of Justice backed out of the settlement. NAR sued them. And basically, um, it's important to note that uh, that suit is ongoing. They won an initial judgment uh, about a year ago. The Department of Justice has, has uh, appealed that judge's decision, and it is an ongoing case. But underlying what we're reading with this, and the Department of Justice has said some very leading things about real estate. Uh, they claim that, that the real estate commission industry in the United States is a hundred billion dollar a year industry and that you are overcharging consumers tens of billions of dollars every year. That is that is from the court filings from the Department of Justice. Okay. A lot of it's based off of a, a paper and I can provide this information out to Albert. He can provide it out to you guys if you want to read it. Uh, the Cato Institute in summer of 2021 published a paper about anti-competition and buying and selling homes. And basically, they are claiming that the time of buyer's agent compensation and the MLS to the MLS listing is predetermining for the buyer what the commission is being paid to their agent, even before knowing what that, who that agent is, or whether or not they're competent. And that that's a tying practice, which in antitrust law, tying is a, a bad thing. So recognize that Biden assigned an executive order in July 9th of 2021 asking the FTC and the Department of Justice to look into the real estate industry. And they've begun to do that. Uh, this just goes through the NAR winning the lawsuit in November of 2022. In June of 2023, they appealed the uh, decision. And we are still in the process of trying to figure out what it is that they want. Subsequent to all of this, subsequent to the, the, 
the decision in the Sitzer case, the Department of Justice has come out to a number of MLSs and basically said, we want you to remove the compensation field out of the multiple listing service. So that is what they're looking for out of this. And the thing that's uh, important to note is that in the Sitzer case that was just decided, the judge is a federal court judge, and he could put an uh, injunction in place that prohibits NAR from having a mandatory commission rule or from having commission fields in MLSs across the country. Oh. We don't know what they're going to do or when it's going to come about. But there's the possibility for that occurring. And it goes back to a lot of what CMLS has been trying to do. How many of you guys do commercial? How much fun is commercial compared to residential? <laughs> it's not emotional. It's not emotional. Uh, wait until you get emotional home buyers into a situation where they can't see everything that's available in the marketplace. My experience on the commercial side is being involved in businesses and looking for places for my businesses to buy, looking for places for my businesses to lease. And when I have a commercial agent tell me, hey, are you around the areas that you'd like to see your company in? And give me numbers off the of signs, and I'll call them for you and see what they got available. That's I'll see. <laughs> how, how do you think the residential consumer is going to face a situation where they don't have access to all of the listings. And there are players out there that want to do that because they look at $100 billion a year and they think, as Zillow has stated in an earnings call, that your pain point is probably 35% of your commissions. So they think your pain point is earning $35 billion a year out of money that's already going into your pocket. And you can kind of see why there's a lot of interest in what well, we are better off with an aggregated database, a database that includes all of the listings that are available in a marketplace. You're better off with that. Your consumer is better off with that. And everything that we're doing at the CRMLS level is trying to give you guys as many tools and much information as we possibly can to keep those pieces of information flowing into the whole holistic service. It's your choice. It is our brokers and our agents' choice of what happens long term. And we hope that we've given you enough information and enough of an impetus, enough of a, a reason to remain part of the multiple listing service, even if compensation is not a part. Cooperation has always been a key factor of what you guys do. You guys are a very strange industry. You guys will go out into the street and beat each other to death but you'll share all the information that you've gotten in order to procure that seller. And you'll bring suppliers to those, those agents who have a, have a listing. So that cooperation is what really needs to remain in place. And the one that I would highly, highly recommend that you guys start thinking through those processes. And we're gonna do as much as we possibly can to make it. We're going to be sending a email out to the brokerage community later this afternoon, uh, outlining what happened in the, the Sitzer case and what potentially could be coming down later. So be prepared for seeing some of those things uh, across the board. With that, I know I've been asking, uh, answering uh, questions as I went. Are there any more additional questions on, on anything that I've done over here today? The lawsuits, uh, some of it I, uh, some of it I, I don't know. I don't know where uh, the judge is going to fall on some of this stuff. I don't know exactly what's going to appease the Department of Justice and the FTC, but uh, I can take stabs at, at those things. Are you guys stunned at this point? Sylvia? I'm kind of going at the wind with this question. So my question is, the DOJ, have they come to you to question the measure of the competency level of uh, real, a realtor? The question is, is, is anybody who comes to multiple listing service, anybody who comes to organized real estate and asked to measure the competency of the agents providing services? And the answer is no. Um, they're more concerned with the dollars that are being paid than any competency at this point. What their stated goal is to drop 
a percent to a percent and a half and a half off of what consumers are paying in the United States for real estate services right now. That's that's their stated goal. Yes. So those of you guys who do commercial, how much you guys pay a month for 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 LA County? Because you know, well, they're in the process of changing that, but for the most part, you only pay for county by county. Yeah, regions. And you guys are paying north of because I do this because I have an attorney on staff who also, you know, can join and co-star. We're paying them 675 bucks a month for two counties. For two counties. Imagine, imagine what a for-profit Wall Street driven company is going to want to do in this marketplace. CoStar bought homes.com and they are they have risen the traffic on homes.com to be the number two portal behind Zillow. And there's this big public fight going on between Zillow and CoStar about who's better at doing what it is that they're going to do long term. So CoStar, CoStar absolutely wants it to the residential marketplace. Yep, they are. I told you, I told you lunch was not going to be very tasty that day. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate the time and the opportunity. Art Carter, we appreciate you here today and kind of ruined our lunch. But it's okay. <laughs> But thank you very much for explaining so well on the lawsuit. Uh, there's a lot of talk, uh, a lot of questions. I think you covered quite a bit of the questions that everybody asked. And it's been going on with CAR, NER a whole week. Uh, webinar, webinar, webinar this whole week regarding that. And thank you so much for explaining so well. Does that mean you still have them in the future? Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> as long as you still want me, I, I will stick up. So, Thank you. And Albert assured me that they do have Coca Cola here somewhere. So, <laughs> well, you have a little a, a, a appreciation, a little token appreciation here for you. And I hope you enjoy it. And we have three bags that we have uh, from the Western Gabriel. And I hope you wear it everywhere you go. <laughs> and one for Amy and one for Dad. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. You're Thank welcome you. to stay for lunch. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Okay, we're gonna line up for lunch in the hallway and we're gonna go through and come back. It's a lot of food and a lot of good food. I always like their food. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So Enjoy your lunch. We'll be back at 12.45, okay? They're gonna help us. Uh, I'm gonna introduce us Karen, uh, Dogra, uh, Stephanie Yi, and uh, Jenna Botilair. Apologies if I butchered your name. Uh, they're going to be helping us be on the nice list through audits and enforcement from the DRE. So without further ado, let's give them a warm welcome and let's pass it on to them. You have the abilities to unmute yourself, so go for it. All right. Well, before we start, um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Karan Dagra with the Department of Real Estate Audit Section. Uh, I've been there since 2010, so right at 13 years uh, with the de department, all with audits. Um, and then um, I'll have Jenna and Stephanie introduce themselves too. So you guys want to introduce yourselves? Uh, yeah, so I'm Jenna Boudelier. I'm um, a special supervising special investigator in the Department of Real Estate's Oakland office. Um, and I've been here for um, 16 years. And I'm Stephanie Yee. I'm the supervising special investigator too and the district office manager in the Department of Real Estate's Oakland office. And I have been with the DRE for 15 years. Perfect. So let's talk about the best topic, audits, right? <laughs> um, uh, you know, you mentioned you want to be on the nice list. So we'll, we'll, we'll share a lot of the things that we see out in the, uh, uh, out in the field and uh, want to take some time to, you know, share some statistics with you guys of what we have seen in the last fiscal year that we finished on our office uh, up here in Sacramento. Um, so we prepared a little presentation to show you guys what we've been seeing out in the field, some of the common violations. Um, so go ahead, go to the next slide. All right. And this is, yeah, so basically we're going to cover, you know, at, um, for the audit section, what we do, some of the statistics, some of the most common violations that we see out there. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the specific violations that we see uh, and share some best practices, some of the trust accounting that needs to be held by all the brokers, how to reconcile properly. Um, so we'll, we'll try to give you guys a brief overview of all of this, uh, these things right here. At the end, we'll share, we'll share some available resources as well. So first thing, let's talk about what kind of businesses we audit from the Department of Real Estate. So number one is sales. We audit sales, we audit property management, uh, mortgage loan activities, broker escrows, business opportunities, uh, subdivisions. Um, these are some of the yeah, main categories that we typically audit. Um, from the audit section. Um, so for 2022 fiscal year, um, we completed 62% routine audits and 38% investigative audits. So the difference is routine audits is where we just pick up the phone. Uh, we, you know, we might just call and schedule an audit with the broker and say, hey, we want to come out, just want to see your records, want to make sure everything's in compliance with the DRE commissioner's regulations. Um, so routine audits, uh, you know, typically we do them throughout the year and investigative audits are more uh, when we received a complaint or we have received something in the DRE and have, has gone through the enforcement section and they want to request an audit from our section. Um, so you, as you guys can see, 38% were investigative, 62% were routine for um, 2022. Uh, so this right here kind of breaks down what type of audits we did complete in 2022 fiscal year. Um, property management still remains to be our highest focus at the moment. 75% uh, of the audits, 75% uh, audits we closed with property management. 13% uh, were mortgage loan audits, 9% were broker escrows, and 3% were something, you know, that, that was more transactional uh, that we looked at. But majority of the, you know, we looked at were the property management audit. So some of the findings of all those audits we did complete, um, you guys can see uh, out of 50% of the audits resulted in minor violations or no violations, which is great, I think. 19% um, of the audits did have major violations. 8% uh, of audits went through a site and find department. And 23 audit, 23 percent of the audits resulted in a corrective action letter, where we just kind of issue a letter to the broker and list out all the things that they need, they need to correct to be in compliance. So 50 percent were minor and non-compliant. So let's discuss some numbers here. Um, shortages that we found in audits. So when we say shortages, basically we're referring to trust accounts. You know, money that's not in, money missing from the trust account to be you know um, easy way to say it. In 2021, we completed 482 audits and found 3.6 million dollars in shortages. From the trust accounts uh basically money was either missing or embezzled or it could be a variety of reasons uh in 2022 uh this last fiscal year we completed 440 audits and we found 9.5 million dollars in shortages you guys can see like the number kind of grew almost tri <laughs> tripled so uh this typically is um, where we find a lot of major violations when we see a lot of trust you know trust funds 
uh, missing from the cluster count or having big large shortages. So this last fiscal year, we did have quite a bit of uh, large shortages that we did uh, uncover. So let's talk about some of the common violations that we see out there when we're you know doing field audits or um, uh, remote audits. So some of the biggest ones are like disclosure of license status or license ID, any advertising material that doesn't have like their, you know, the list broker or the salesperson and their license ID. We typically find that a lot. Uh, we find a lot of, you know, um, businesses using false fictitious business name that's not registered with the DRE. So with that is sometimes, you know, you, you can have a business registered with the county, but it, it also needs to be registered with the DRE to, for it to be, you know, in compliance. Um, we do find broker supervision issues a lot. Uh, out there where we have, you know, brokers running multiple, multiple offices, but they don't have any supervision agreements or they're not really supervising out there. So we do see that a lot. Um, and the biggest one, obviously, is uh, these on our end is trust fund violations that we see co most commonly when and basically record keeping, uh, trust fund shortage we just talked about, you know, who's withdrawing the funds from the trust account, commingling of the trust account. So these right here are the main, I will probably say 80 to 90% what we normally see uh, out there in some of the audits. So I just wanted to talk about just a couple um, major trust fund regulations uh, that we do see out there a lot and we do see a lot of um, violations on. So number one, I would say is the 2831 violation. Again, this refers to brokers that are maintaining trust accounts and that are holding trust funds so that this is when this all these regulations kick in. Uh, 2831 talks about, you know, maintaining trust account records, making sure you keep a record of all the deposit receipts, cancel checks, bank statements and signature cards, uh, making sure you have a good accounting uh, accounting system or accounting rec uh, lo trust log system uh, where you report all the trust funds that are received and dispersed, uh, separate records for each beneficiary, monthly account reconciliations, um, or any transaction files that you have regarding a property for managing it. Uh, so all these records are very we look at when we come out there and do an audit so that falls under 2831 uh trust account uh, records the next one is 2832 uh this refers to you know where can you place these trust funds when you collect for example rent on a behalf of an owner um so this you know this regulation talks about we have to make sure that the trust funds are you know deposited into a natural escrow depository account so a trust account uh, and that trust account usually is maintained by the broker uh, and then that trust account also needs to be in the name of the broker or the broker's license DBA. And then also, uh, we also have to make sure that, you know, if you're collecting rent or any trust funds on behalf of the owner or be behalf of a beneficiary, it needs to be deposited no later than three business days in the account. Um, and business, uh, uh, caveat is business days. So it's holidays, you know, we don't count those, but uh, any trust funds that are collected on behalf of anybody, it needs to be deposited no later than three business days in the trust. Right. Trust fund handling, uh, regulation 2834. This is also very, um, common one that we see out there where we find violations on, like who can withdraw the money from the trust account. Um, so the, the regulation says the withdrawals may be made from a trust account upon the signature of the broker or in case of a corporate broker or license officer through the whole, uh, the corporation is licensed. So for the most part, basically what it's saying is, you know, a real estate salesperson that's licensed with a broker can be on the signature card and can withdraw funds uh, as long as they have a written agreement for that. Um, and usually it's usually the brokers. A lot of times the violations that we see here is, you know, they might be a bookkeeper that a company, a broker has, and they're on the signature card because they deal with a lot of record keeping and signing checks, but if they're not licensed uh, salesperson to the broker, then you know that does fall under a violation. Um, and there's a ways around that. We'll talk about that in the next slide, slide but typically uh, what it should be is just a broker and the salesperson should be only authorized. So for example, now if you do have a bookkeeper that you authorize to sign checks, out of a trust account, then and they're not licensed, then they need to have a, a fidelity bond or insurance coverage uh, that covers at least the maximum amount of trust funds in that account at any given time. Um, mm -hmm. Usually, this is where we see a lot of fall through is when we have bookkeepers they're not licensed, they don't have a bond, so then it results in a violation for that for that specific uh, regulation twenty thirty four. Uh, but the fidelity bond is allowed for if you have somebody you want to authorized to sign checks and they're not licensed you can you do have the option to get them a, a bond that covers the maximum amount of the trust um, trust funds at any given day so this kind of continues regulation 20 to who can fund, who can disperse funds electronically nowadays a lot of the business is done electronically i mean uh there, i mean there's still i would say 50 50 brokers that are still signing checks but a lot of things are done electronically uh and that same rule applies here so if you have somebody dispersing or paying bills and uh dispersing funds out of a trust account 
Um, same thing here, they need to be licensed under the broker or they need to have a fidelity bond if they're not licensed with the broker. So trust account records. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit, go ahead. Um, so control records, so the, basically this again applies to brokers that are maintaining trust funds uh, or you know, typically property manager where we see a lot of this. Um, so one of the things they need to maintain is a control record and account, there's a lot of accounting systems out there now that you know, the, the have, might have different names for this report. Sometimes it's called bank account activity report, bank register listing, general ledger. But basically what a control record is, is basically a, a record of all the ins and outs out of a, of a bank account. So all the transactions that are taking place, deposits, disbursements, uh, having a chronological sequence of all the um, transactions that are taking place out of the bank account. Uh, so some form of record, you need to have that. And this again applies to each bank account. So if you have four bank, four trust accounts, five trust accounts, and you need to have this record for each each in uh, each account that you manage. So there's a here's an example of what a control record will look like. Um, basically, you know, you just kind of and again, this is very old school way of showing this, but a lot of the uh, accounting systems now, you know, that people use or Excel even uh, have this uh, capability of producing this. But basically, you just record each day uh, who the money came from or who the money went to, description and just kind of locking in each transaction uh, as it occurs on the on the bank account. And again, you have to have this for each bank account or each trust account that you manage for the, for your business. Next slide. Um, this is just another example of, um, so this example here actually, we, we see this in sales a lot. So basically if you don't have a trust account where you are collecting trust funds on behalf of a beneficiary, then giving it to the beneficiary, then you need to maintain this log uh, showing, you know, when the, when did you collect the funds and when, when did you give it to the owner? So this one is, you don't have a trust account, but you're just collecting checks or anything on behalf of the owner, just giving it basically to the owner. So then you still have to have a log of all the trust funds that were collected, even though it didn't go to a trust account, um, you still collected it as a broker. So you still have to have a log for, for that. The other record is pretty common that we see out there. Um, we see violations on is separate beneficiary records. Now, this is different from the control record that we just showed. This is mainly like each individual owner. So for example, owner A that you manage a property for, you have to have a, a ledger for that one specific owner and recording all the activity for that owner. So basically all the money they came in, rent collected, repairs paid, and you know management fees, paying, paying the beneficiary. Um, so each owner on top of the bank account ledger, you have to have a record for each individual owner as well. So a lot of times what happens is when we go out in the audit, we don't see, they'll see like a control red ledger for the whole bank account, but, but some of the uh, brokers don't have individual ledgers for each owner. So this regulation talks about, you know, uh, all the brokers, anybody collecting trust funds uh, need to have each individual owner record as well, which is, which is referred to as a separate beneficiary record. Uh, and again, a lot of softwares out there now uh, have the capability of producing this report. They just call it differently. Uh, sometimes it's called general ledger by property. Uh, trial balance details, account ledgers, as long as they have the information, that's what we're looking for when we are out there in the audit. So here's an example of a separate beneficiary record. Um, so this is again, like I said, this is a very manual way of showing this. Basically you put the owner name and all the information on here is, you know, when the when rents came in or anything you collected, anything you dispersed. But again, this is managed, this is kept for each individual owner instead of the bank account. This is every owner needs to have this kind of sort of record. So um this is just an example of a very basic separate record, what it should have and all the items. One thing we want to talk about is the negative balances. Uh, a lot of times we we do see this um, violation where, you know, um, you, you collected rent from an owner and then there's a big repair that needs to be done and they don't have enough funds in their account and we see, you know, repairs authorized and that the owner account went into negative. Um, the only issue with that is, you know, if you're managing, say, 10, 15 owners, they're all in the bank account and you disperse you know, more than what that owner has, then you're basically dispersing, you know, funds from other owners. So we call that a negative balance. So how to avoid this problem is basically make, making sure that you have enough funds for that individual owner before you authorize a repair or anything like that. Um, being tough on tenants that give NSF checks, you know, that can cause the account to go negative for that individual owner. Making sure you're reconciling each owner account every month. Um, and just having written policies and procedures with the owners that you're managing properties for um on how they you know how, on how to proceed with any repairs or something like that that comes up and it's more than what they have in their account so uh and just be actively involved in accounting 
that's the biggest thing. Uh, just make sure you know it, you know, every month of what each owner has and before you authorize any repairs. So we do see that, so see this violation time to time. Um, and, you know, typically it's corrected the following month, but we like to have, ne never have a negative balance in the end of a month of, uh, for an owner. All right, next slide. Um, so that was a chunk of the main violations that we see out there from the audit department. Um, so I want to kind of take some time and cover that with you guys. Uh, we do have a lot of information on our DRE homepage, or dre.ca.gov. Um, you know, there's a click right there. Is real estate business resources. So we have a lot of a lot of the forms that we shared. They're actually on our website that you guys have access to, um, which is makes it easier for everybody to kind of follow along. So I think that's uh, okay. And then on the when you click on the real estate business resources tab on the website, you will see a lot of these. Um, uh, manuals and 10 most common violations found in DRE audits, trust, this trust funds, uh, PDF basically has a lot of the information that I just covered uh, and examples of how to maintain proper records if you're collecting trust funds. Uh, it's all on our website to help to help the licensees. And we also have a reference book. Uh, this is a great resource for you guys to see if you ever have any questions on specific items or any transactions, obviously, you know, refer to a reference book. A lot of good information is on there as well. All right, that's it for me. Well, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the <laughs> 15, 20 minute conversation we had, but basically we just wanted to come out and give you guys like some of the common violations, like I said, share some statistics. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Uh, and I'll pass it on to Stephanie. Hi. Um... Once again, I'm Stephanie Yi, and I will be presenting today with Jenna Boudelier. Um, we'll be covering enforcement, broker supervision, and risk management. And our agenda for today uh, will be enforcement overview, risk management, and su broker supervision, and resources. DRE mission and purpose. The DRE's mission is to safeguard and promote the public interest in real estate matters through licensure, regulation, education, and enforcement. The DRE's purpose is to be an effective consumer advocate by monitoring and regulating industry practices while promoting public awareness, and to be an effective customer-focused department providing timely and efficient services to licensees, subdividers, and consumers. Protection. Business and Professions Code Section 10050.1 states that protection of the public shall be the highest priority for the Department of Real Estate in exercising its licensing, regulatory, and disciplinary functions regulatory authority. The DRE has authority to enforce the Real Estate Law and Subdivided Lands Act, and DRE investigations can look into licensees who are real estate brokers, uh, real estate corporations, real estate brokers and officers, or real estate salespersons, unlicensed persons, and these may be um, individual, in, individuals who are conducting activities which require a real estate license, but they do not have a real estate license. An unlicensed person may include someone who has never been issued a real estate license by the DRE, someone whose DRE license has been revoked or suspended, or a person who's continuing to perform activities which require a real estate license, even though their DRE license has expired. Licensed applicants, um, licensed applicants may be subject to an investigation if they have criminal convictions in their background or have a professional license that has been disciplined by another regulatory agency. Enforcement violations, licensing compliance, an example of licensing compliance, um, licensing compliance violation would be a licensee who is using a fictitious business name or a DBA without it being registered with the DRE. Advertising, an example would be a DRE licensee who is not displaying their license number on a flyer for the marketing of a property. Misrepresentation or dishonest dealing. An example of misrepresentation could be that a listing agent represents that a property that is for sale has a room addition that was completed through a proper permitting process, but in fact, the room addition is actually unpermitted. A buyer who's relying on this representation to be accurate purchases the property. However, had the buyer known that the room was unpermitted, they would not have placed an offer for that property in the first place. An example of dishonest dealing could be a listing agent advising a client to accept an offer that is not favorable to that client because the listing agent has an undisclosed vested interest in that particular offer. Negligence or incompetence. An example of negligence is a listing agent being overwhelmed with a large number of offers that they've received for a property. The listing agent ends up missing uh, a particular offer and does not 
provide that to the seller for their review. Had the seller been provided with the offer in a timely manner, the seller would have selected that offer. But instead, because of the real estate agent's negligence, they were never able to consider that offer. An example of incompetence, let's say a broker runs a property management business. They hire a bookkeeper to assist them with trust fund handling, record keeping. The bookkeeper's record keeping is actually not in compliance, but the broker is unable to detect that the records are not in compliance because they do not independently have the knowledge themselves to understand the records and to understand what the DRE requires of those records. Failure to supervise. Um, this could be violations that occur due to a lack of broker policies and procedures in place or the lack of systems in place to enforce those policies. Unlicensed activity. An example is a real estate licensee that continues to operate um, with an expired license because they failed to renew their license on time. And trust, for, trust fund record keeping. An example is a broker engaged in property management has less funds in their broker trust account than their accountability and visits. Um, these visits can be routine or proactive, and the objectives for a routine or proactive visit are education and compliance. And for an investigative enforcement visits, not only um, are education and compliance objectives, but also complaint resolution. And for investigative visits, the DRE generally has knowledge of an allegation of a possible violation of the real estate law. This is a program in which the primary objective is to provide outreach to the industry through information sharing, communication, and engagement, and also to increase visibility and interaction with the industry. There are two types of enforcement field program visits. The first is a proactive broker office survey. And the purpose is to inform and assist the real estate community and ensure licensees are aware of and complying with the applicable real estate laws and regulations. The second type of visit is a discipline follow-up in which the DRE meets with restricted licensees and their supervising broker, if applicable, to ensure that restricted licensees are in compliance with the terms of their disciplinary order and that the broker is closely supervising the restricted licensee. So Stephanie mentioned broker office surveys. So a broker office survey is generally when a special investigator from the enforcement section meets with a broker. It's usually at their office and they're just looking at operations to see if the business is in compliance. So they'll ask the broker a series of questions and review records. And then the broker would also have an opportunity to ask questions um, if, if they wanted to as well. Um, if you want to find more information about a broker office survey and some tips on how to prepare, um, there's an article in our summer 2019 real estate bulletin. So here's some numbers that show the license population as of July 31st of 2023. So there are 434, 444,361 total licensees, 29% are brokers and 71% are salespersons. Here we have some enforcement statistics. Um, showing some of the, the work that we've done the past few fiscal years. So most recently in fiscal year 2022 to 2023, we received 4,989 complaints. 3,399 of those complaints were referred for investigation and 936 uh, were referred for disciplinary action. So a large part of what we do in enforcement is investigate complaints. Uh, so we get complaints from a few different sources. It could be from consumers, other people in the industry, law enforcement, and sometimes we open an investigation on our own. So the general process is to review the investigation and see if we have jurisdiction. Um, if we do, then it's referred for uh, investigation. When we do the investigation, we're looking for clear and convincing evidence of a violation. So that's the standard of proof that we have to meet. So it's more than what you would need in a civil court and less than what you would need in a criminal court. Uh, so at the end of the investigation, if there is not clear and convincing evidence, then the uh, investigation would be closed. If we did find evidence, then it could potentially be referred to our legal section, uh, which could result in a disciplinary hearing um, or a settlement, and then a final decision from the commissioner. So these are the uh, different disciplinary tools we have available. So starting at the lower end of the spectrum, we have a corrective action letter. So this is not something that's part of the public record. Uh, citation and fine. Um, this is a public record, but it's not posted on the website. And then we have suspension, restriction, voluntary surrender, revocation, public approval, 
bar order and desist and refrain order. And you can find um, disciplinary actions that are posted monthly. So I believe this is what they would refer to as the naughty list from earlier. Um, so you can find that on our website um, under the licensees tab. So risk management is one of the most, um, broker supervision is one of the most uh, important elements of risk management. So the code sections that cover this are Business and Professions Code 10159.2 and 10177H, as well as Commissioner's Regulation 2725. So uh, those regulations basically say a broker has to exercise reasonable supervision over the activities of his or her affiliate licensees. And broker supervision is the phrase that we use when describing the broker's responsibilities for supervising and monitoring those real estate related activities. Um, and salespersons and broker associates can only act on behalf of and under the supervision of their affiliated broker. So there are two main parts to broker supervision. So the first is to establish policies, rules, procedures, and systems. But it's not enough to just have a policy and procedures manual. You also have to develop systems to review, oversee, inspect, manage, and monitor the policies, rules, procedures, and systems. Um, you can't just rely on the fact that you do have a policy. You have to check and make sure that, that agents are aware, that they're trained, and that you're following up to making sure that, that those, um, those policies are actually being followed. And what to supervise? Um, pursuant to Commissioner's Regulation 2725, reasonable supervision includes the establishment of policies, rules, procedures, and systems to review, inspect, oversee, and manage the following. Transactions requiring a real estate license, documents that may have a material effect upon rights or obligations of a party to a transaction, filing, storage, and maintenance of transaction documents, trust fund handling, advertising, requirements of federal and state law relating to prohibitions against discrimination, regular and consistent reports of license activities of affiliated licensees. Broker supervision considerations. When establishing policies, procedures, and systems for their brokerage, a broker should consider the number of licensees, the number of branch offices, and the location of branch offices. For example, a broker should keep in mind that supervising a brokerage with 500 licensees and 10 branch offices located in multiple counties throughout the state may require different policies, procedures, and systems to ensure broker supervision versus a broker who employs five licensees and does not have any branch office locations. Branch or division managers. Associate brokers and salespersons may assist in administering the policies and procedures so long as the broker retains overall responsibility for supervising his or her salespersons. And this is described in Business and Professions Code Section 10164 and the DRE form RE242, the branch or division manager appointment, can be used for adding or canceling a branch or division manager. Broker supervision in advertising. And a broker should consider, like, are there brokerage or brand advertising standards and requirements? Are affiliate licensees provided information resources to help them prepare their advertising? Who reviews and approves advertising of affiliate licensees before use? If an unlicensed employee prepares the advertisement, is it done under the direction of a licensee and subject to broker supervision? How often does the broker or designated manager spot check their affiliate licensee's advertising materials? If compliance issues are found, what action does the broker take to make corrections? What happens if an affiliate licensee violates the broker's policies, rules, or procedures? Failed broker supervision. The failure to supervise may result in harm to consumers, compliance violations, and license discipline. Termination for cause. Uh, reporting termination for cause, Business and Professions Code Section 10178, requires that a broker report the discharge of a salesperson to the DRE for a violation of the real estate law. The broker is required to submit a certified written statement of facts and failure by the broker to comply with Business and Professions Code Section 10178 may subject the broker to license discipline. Um, the Benefit of the Doubt program. The program helps to promote compliance with Business and Professions Code Section 10178. The program ensures that re the reporting broker does not autom automatically get added to the investigation as a respondent. However, the broker may be added as a respondent later during the investigation if it is determined that the broker has engaged in unlawful activity or if the Violations committed by the salesperson were due to um, or can be attributed to the broker's lack of oversight. And 
the spring 2014 real estate um, bulletin does include an article that outlines the program. Help your clients. Um, prevention um, can be done through education, research, and by asking questions. And this may help eliminate issues or reduce the chances of miscommunication. Um, reporting. If you do run into a situation where there's an unscrupulous licensee, um, you may consider contacting law enforcement if the matter is criminal. A licensing agency such as the DRE, if there are a violation, um, for us, if there's a violation of the real estate law, and or you may want to contact an applicable trade group or association. So Stephanie just talked about how important prevention is, um, and we get a lot of consumer complaints where they claim that required disclosures weren't made or a material issue was discovered after the transaction closed. Uh, so some examples of this are an agent was really helpful up until the time the escrow opened, uh, but then they stopped communicating. Disclosures and documents were sent electronically. The client didn't read the documents. The client signed the documents on a cell phone or a tablet, and the agent didn't review or explain the documents. So taking that extra step in that time to review and explain each process, uh, each step in the process, as well as required disclosures and other paperwork could help uh, the process go more smoothly for everyone involved and hopefully prevent problems from happening in the future. So some things you can do to avoid uh, violations. The first one is really easy, is to check your license. So if you go to our website, um, you can type in your name or your license number, and then you can see what your record shows. So is your uh, main office address up to date? Are you using any DBAs that aren't on there? Are all of the uh, salespersons that are affiliated with you on that record as well? Um, so that will help prevent a lot of those um, compliance violations. We publish a quarterly real estate bulletin online. So there are a lot of um, you know, relevant and timely topics that are discussed in the bulletin. Uh, the real estate law book, the broker compliance evaluation manual, broker self-evaluation, trust fund guide, and license disclosure requirements for advertising. Uh, so these two forms, there's one for uh, sales uh, and property management activity and another for mortgage lending activity. And so it's really a cheat sheet that tells you based on the type of advertising that you're doing, what needs to be included in the advertisement. So it's a really good handy reference tool. So some best practices if you do find violations uh, is to ensure that a violation isn't occurring throughout your brokerage. Uh, Try and determine if it's isolated to one team or one agent, or is it more of a global problem? Uh, you may need to revise and update existing policies and trainings. Uh, you also may need to update systems to prevent violations from occurring uh, or institute new monitoring systems. Um, and then also it's good to document your efforts. Um, if there is a situation where someone that you supervise um, they have they, they're, a complaint is filed against them and the department might be looking into that, um, you want to be able to show that you were, in fact, supervising uh, your uh, salespersons and broker associates. So the department is currently conducting a job analysis survey uh, to get information about job requirements of licensed real estate professionals. So if you take the survey, you get three hours of continuing education credit. Uh, it has to be completed by November 8th, so there's still a few days to do that. Uh, so you can follow that um, QR code or it's also prominently displayed on the homepage of our website. And um, we also do an occupational analysis every five to seven years. And that's just to make sure that the exams we give for uh, broker and salesperson licenses are valid, legally defensible, and that they prepare people to enter the real estate profession. So we're looking for subject matter experts. So if that sounds like you and that's something you're interested in, uh, you can email uh, Jeff Oboisky and he is our assistant uh, commissioner of licensing. I also want to just Bring to everyone's attention that starting January 1st, all applicants have to meet a new pre-licensed education requirement. So the real estate practice course has been revised. So this applies to everyone who submits an application uh, to take the salesperson or broker exam received um, on or after January 1st. So it's not postmarked, but it's received by um, so this reply, uh, applies to new agents who are applying for the salesperson exam, uh, or also if you're currently a salesperson wanting to take the broker exam, um, if it's after January 1st, then you'll have to take the revised course. 
Um, and just another reminder about e-licensing. So this is the quickest, easiest way to make changes to your license. Uh, it's available 24 seven. Um, but if you do have to use a paper form, you can find uh, processing timeframes on our website um, and that will give you an idea about how long you'll have to wait for that to be processed. And here's how you can contact us. We have a, um, a uh, general number where you can reach licensing, enforcement, subdivisions, mortgage lending. Um, you can also go to Ask DRE Licensing from our webpage and fill out um, a contact form and have someone reach back out to you. Uh, and we're on social media. And uh, that's that's the end of our portion. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's give them another round of applause for keeping us on the nice list. Um, and let's see. Is there any questions on Zoom? We're clear on questions. Oh, yeah. Did you have a question, sir? Yeah. Uh, the question that's being asked is, what are the responsibilities of a broker regarding their TC? You mean transaction coordinator? Yeah, correct. Yes, correct. Yeah. Um, so that's not um, a, a position that requires a license, but anything that's done under the broker's license um, really is their responsibility. So they would need to supervise that transaction coordinator, uh, make sure that they receive the training that's required um, so that any activity done under their license is in compliance. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Level in regards to transaction coordinating and how they interact with the consumer, and there's no full transparency on their interaction with the consumer. Number one, number two, um, some are licensed, some are not licensed, but with all the e signing, the some um, transaction coordinating persons are assuming responsibility of signature being disclosed. Um, I personally feel that the consumer should know. If there is a transaction coordinator involved, and there should be a disclosure of an outline of what their responsibilities are um, to avoid any future conflict. What are your thoughts? Um, so, you know, we don't currently have any regulations um, regarding that. Um, and and I don't want to speak you know, on behalf of the, the department to, to give an opinion, but you know, currently we don't have regulations. But, um, you know, if you think that that's uh, something that should be done. Um, you can, you know, speak to the association about it, or speak with your um, state representative, and and maybe make um, a suggestion that more regulation needs to be um, made in that area. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. All right. Um, we're gonna leave it open for one last question. If there's any out there, if there is not. Let's go ahead and close out the Q and A session. And uh, let's go to our next session. Um, my my awesome uh, co-host and also vice chair, Cecilia Wen. Uh, Cecilia? Yes. Joe Pierre, you are our guest speaker. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, now we have our guest speaker, John Wu. He is an instructor of a Real Estate Business Institute, REBI, and uh, Instructor for Certified Real Estate Brokerage Managers, CRB, and Certified International Property Specialist, CIPS, and also accredited Buyer's Representative, ABR. Even though uh, he started his uh, real estate career since 2002, and he also served as the NAR President's Liaison to Taiwan from 2011 to 2014, was the International Committee Chair for West and Gabriel Valley Realtors, WSGVR. So, and he also served as president of the Chinese American Real Estate Professional Association, TARIPA. So, most of all, John Wu is the current Vice Mayor of the City of San Gabriel. Let's welcome and have a round applause to welcome Mr. John Wu. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John Wu. Sorry, I'm late. 
And uh, so I was told that I have another 30 minutes to share my thought, but no worry. I mean, I will try to expedite a little, but how many of you here today is a broker licensee? Not many of you. And how many, for those, you're a broker that are you managing an office? More than five people, please raise your hand. Less than 100? Oh, I'm sorry. How many? 400. Wow. So any any higher number? Okay, it goes to you. Congratulations. Well, I'm John Wu. I mean, uh, thank you so much, Cecilia, for the introduction. Uh, you know, those are, I, I call those are like an old history that I serve as a president, serve as a chairperson uh, for CARPA, for Western Cape Board. Uh, it's just more than 20 years sometimes. So it's time really flies, but I'm still here as a, a very loyal members in this association. I'm also the uh, the CIP instructor, the CIPS instructor. Uh, and I think this is important that to know how we can survive in this very critical business environment. And let me share something with you that CRP is a designation that it's just like CIPS, CCIM, you know, ABR, you know, you got a PIN, you got a destination, you complete your courses and you become a certified, uh, you know, specialist in this territory, especially broker manager. But today we will be talking about the recruitment. The most important things as a broker, broker owners or broker manager. Well, um, do you mind, what's your name? Mark, can I call you Mark? So Mark, um, do you do you do your own transaction when you're managing your your office? Yeah, your own transaction on your listing. Do you do that? You do that, right? So how you think is this important to be a like time manager? You you can manage your time. I mean, why why are you having like a, the employees? You need a lot of staffs. You need a lot of uh, you know like a secretary, receptionist, accountant, and you're still able to do your own business because you have hired a manager. Okay, so that's the answer, the manager. But how about the number? You know, you have like less than like 20 people in your company. Do you have any that uh, you manage a, a real estate firm that is less than 20 real estate professionals? Yes. So you are able to handle your own transaction. Wow, look at that. I mean, this is amazing that you're doing so well on the time management. All professional way, right? That's wonderful. The clients also, I mean, they prefer to do it that way too. But you need to recruit new plus, but how? And when you are stepping into a new territory from an agent to a broker, as an agent, what's your priority? You will be really care about that how many transactions you close a year. You may worry about that, that commission split. But when you become a broker and you start to manage an office, then you have to change the mentality that the things is will be changed. It's a different now. So you are thinking about how you can create a better revenue by recruiting more professionals, not just about the transaction, that how many transactions you can do, you know, your own commission. You have to think about other people's commission because that will be a part of yours. So the key for that is how many recruits must be added to your company. And what commission split you will be paying instead of getting? So that is totally different. When people, they start their career, it's not like a, you are born as a broker. You will start from a salesperson. You will work for a, you know, a great brand company, Coal Banker, Century 21, Remax. So Mark, what's your, when you started your career, which company you're familiar with? Coba Banker. Banker. Yes, that was my company, my first company as well. And I remember that first time when I got my 
uh, real estate license. It's a salesperson license. Then next year I said, oh, I need to get my broker license. It sounds like a strong, it sounds more powerful. So then my friend said, you know what, John? Don't do it because that means you are having more responsibility. You will be getting more trouble. We have the DRE investigators there, auditor there, and they will be looked after you. But be honest to you that I feel I'm really grateful that I got my broker license right after the salesperson. It just get more knowledge, but you have you can manage your career, you know, better. But when you become a broker, there's a transition. Like I was getting a commission, but now I would like to become a person that distributes a commission. So what is the most concern you have when you become a broker manager or you start your own firm? So Mark, what's your what's your most concern at the time that you become to step into the Real estate world as a manager. Um, just uh, I would say getting our agents more involved with uh, everything that's going on. So, what about the uh, overhead? So, do you think that uh, when you become a manager, do you have some overhead? You have become an owner that you start paying something. Yes. Instead of just renting a table, a desk, you pay the desk fee. So, what other expenses there you you're expecting? When you become a broker, the real broker, hiring people. Mm -hmm. um, besides the overhead, is it staff? Yes, staff. Yeah, their staff. The payroll. Right. And it's not just a boutique office, it's an actual fully run office mm -hmm. where you actually have a bookkeeper, you have the managers, you have the development managers, recruiting. I, I mean, the list goes on. The, the education portion of it, um, keeping the engagement with the agents in the community. I think there's a lot more challenges right now in the recruiting business because of the, of the pyramid kind of companies. Oh, yes, yes. I agree with that. I'll be covered that part as well. But the most interesting thing is when you, this is so difficult for a person that who get regular pay from that regular job to a, like a, we call freelance or self-employee position. This is a big jump because you start as something with not a certain income. You could like keep hungry for six months, eight months, then you got your first commission. So that is the first jump. But there'll be a second jump. If you are doing so well on your real estate transactions, you're a super top sales, and you will start thinking, I have so many friends, I would like to invite them to join us together so we can make a pie of people. So that's a second thought. But what is the cost of that? The cost will be you're paying all the money out first, and you don't know if those little soldiers will produce enough to cover all the, the overhead, the cost. Is that correct? That's correct. And those little soldiers are still going to growing, you know, improve their business, and that's adding more cost. So while people are still struggling, you are, you struggle too. If you are a broker manager, you need to recruit the right person. And you know, when there is one recruit, if you recruit a one wrong person, that will cost you more, spend more of your time, and to take care of the mess. As opposed to finding a sweet spot in Great. Right. So that's that's important that how we can recruit the right person. So here is the things. As a broker, you have to be really self-disciplined. You've got to know. I have to make a call call. Is it more difficult to make a call call to agents than making a call call to the customer? You know, if you can call, the, do the call call to the customer, the potential seller, then you're okay. Because usually the real estate professional will treat us nicer as a broker. They respect you because we are in the same industry. We are not trying to get something from you, but we try to make them, invite them to the team and make the, pea, the pie bigger and make more profit. But for that, you've got to hire the right people. We will define what, the, what does that mean, right people. Then we have to pay them fairly. You know, this is something that we always ask the broker. Can I have like a bigger pie? Can I have like a, a better portion? Not just the beginner, but we are experienced, so we, we deserve a better, share 
of the commission to pay them fairly and help them succeed. So people there are still struggling. They don't know where their future is. They have still lack of techniques to get the business. You've got to help them. They succeed, you succeed. So that's why when you hire the right people, you pay them well, you retain those people in your company. Then make them succeed. That's very important. So that's why at the beginning I asked Mark and I said, well, what about the time management? You are having all the people to deal with, not the customer. Before the customer, you have to deal with all your employees, staffs, accountant, bookkeepers, attorney sometimes. So you got to be a very good managing on your own time because your time will be spending more on managing the company instead of recruiting the people. Then, you know, outreach to the customer. To you, outreach to the customer is no longer the most priority task because you're not the agent. You've got to think, think about you're the boss. You have to feed, you have to pay the, you know, you have to handle the payroll. You've got to feed the family, their family too. So if you don't run the day and you would let the day runs you, you have to stay focused on something so important as the managing level. So you have to be a really prioritize your task. You got to call people, those agents who might be interested in joining you instead of just calling, do you want to sell your house? Do you want to list your property with me? Are you thinking about to sell your house within three months or something? That is totally different. You've got to be a Mike Ferry, but in the broker side. you got to call those agents and contact the agent. So the bottom line is, you've got to find out the profit. Your income is no longer from generated by the transaction as we're closed from you know, the, the daily transaction. You've got to find that a good way, a great income from those agent work for you. And the most important thing is why you think those people are able to generate the income. They're maybe sitting there and have a cup of tea, you know, and just start reading the newspaper and spend another day, daily, every day, every day. So you have to provide them something, make them work for you and make them happy to stay with you and make them make the money and make your real estate firms become more successful. So you have to hire the right agents as the right compensation, and you will earn the income because your income is based on their production. So there are a couple, um, there are a couple websites that you can take photo of that, that normally the broker will use those uh, websites in the system, they're able to assist you to keep your calendars on track. This is a calendly.com. The next one is getplan.co. Co. This is a very interesting one. This is like a forcing you to move forward. You, you will set a time that you have to make yourself finish a task within certain time. So this is a really nice one. The tomato timer. Have you heard about this news just came out yesterday? This jury finds that realtor, actually the NAR, NAR will be paying $1.8 billion because they believe that as a realtor, we inflate the property price. Is that fair? I personally don't, you know, I don't make a judgment on that, but personally, I would say we, we are not the cause of the, you know, property inflation. We are helping the customer. Um, you know, we have a, we've been trained as I like to follow the code of ethics. We do whatever we can to protect the clients. So as a broker, please advocate whatever the NAR is doing, because that is important. That is, we are keeping our value. We defend our value. But next one is, I'm not going to, the next example I'm going to share with you is about a commission, but I cannot tell you the percentage of commission because that is and I trust. But let me give you a generic example. So for example, the income from sales, the average sales price per property is like 450. 
for a beginning agent who is so new, maybe they can just got it from like a 325. The average commission, maybe you some people get three, 3.5, two, 10, one, zero. But average commission per property will be approximately like this number. And more experienced agent, of course, they are able to make more productions, which is six, maybe double than the beginning agent. So we, we this is a very easy calculation that you know the average commission generated per agent annually, that they may provide you a certain income. But one agent is not enough, right? So that's why we need to recruit more. But the study shows it takes at least minimal of 14 contacts for an experienced agent to make a move to your company. You've got to call them, but they will say no at the beginning. You call them again, they will say no. And you start to talk to them and be a friend with them, and they will be having a coffee with you. Then you have a deeper conversation, and you're able to have a, a very productive communication with them, and you're able to recruit them. That will be the best result. But the study shows that you at least get a 14 times context for an experienced agent. So we have to talk about why agents want to move. Do you have a, an agent that will just move from one to another just in a few months and they just move another new one just in another few months? Hoppers. Hoppers, yes. It's like Halloween hoppers. <laughs> no, not Halloween, I'm sorry. That is a... <laughs> too many holidays but but is that good for hoppers is are they always looking for a better place to to work i think it's a better place i feel like they're chasing the dollar that's not there okay they are chasing it they are so, so mm -hmm. zero plus zero still equals the same thing right and they are just wasting your time right because they have to reprint their business card no matter what i had one agent that i had to fire in two weeks because um that person had misled three agencies at the same time. That what does that, that mean? Was still okay. Oh, their license hung at our office, but was misleading these other people. Oh my God! Okay, I see. Yeah, unethical is very. This is very serious issue. You know, if you are hiring people that is not following that, you know, that is a bottom line. Yeah. to us so if they are unethical yes that is we call the hire we don't call fire because it's kind of like broken heart words so we say right. the hire so why agents want to move on hire yes <laughs> like okay that's a good word too but why agents want to move you got to find out a reason that you know who you should approach right so for example you are uh, such a great a reputation broker so people think you're reliable you pay them fair they they heard about you from somewhere else from the association from their colleagues or from their friends they say oh you know what this company is so good they pay me so well and i think that this is the right place that you should move if you consider you know relocate or you're considered to find a new company or you're not happy with your current one so reputation and image the market share and agent productivity. When agent, they are become a top agent. They would, they will be doing two things. One, talk to their broker. I deserve better commission speed. That is the first step. And second step, I'll jump to another company. So that means they are more money commission oriented, orientated agents. They would like to look for a better split for them that's just about the money they don't care about if this is a good reputation uh company if this is a right place uh, with a lot of support because they have their own uh business method or techniques so they don't care the name brands recognition that's how i joined my first company for 20 years total banker company reputation cultural or energy level energy level is another things that we should consider because when you start with a company or when you you know when you were agent you joined this company for some reason that time 
oh my God, all my colleagues, they're young, energetic, nice looking, driving famous car. Those are very attractive moments. But when you like a, spend like a 10 years, 20 years, and you, you realize this is not the only thing and people that are getting old surrounding you, surrounding you, and you think, you know what? I need a newer place. I feel I'm getting old here. I don't want to retire this way. So that's another way you think this is lack of energy. I want to find somewhere that will bring me a new, you know, like a Develop. new power. Yeah. It's a mo new motivation that we can do better. We can do more. I don't want to be, be you know, I don't want to be left behind. So that will be energy, energy level things. So other agents at firms or friends, they refer you. They tell you, you know what? My boss is so good. You know, paying me a good share of commissions, and also I can get some share of the company stock, for example. So that could be another good reason. Level of support, staff, managing, you know, management, marketing, transactional. So what is being transactional? Who needs more support like this? Most agents, they are so they are really not organized on their paperwork. And that caused a lot of lawsuits. So who needs to help them? The TC, transaction coordinator. Experience. Yes, oh, okay, thank you. Experience TC, right? Well, they're not just making a phone call and, hey, please sign back the paperwork. I just need this, I just need that, but you know, it doesn't matter what is that, it just shows on the list. It should be like experience, of course, and that costs some money. But that is a part of level of support. When you spend more money on an experienced TC, you're protecting yourself as well as a broker because you protect them, you protect you. So that is a very, it's, it's the level of support. But if what about if a very experienced agent, he always or she always know what she is doing. She's okay. I don't care if you have TC. I have my own TC. I have my daughter as my TC. That's totally fine. But the motivation could be the staff is so nice, staff is organized, friendly, you know, supporting them, give them a cup of coffee at the, in the beginning of the, the, the whole morning. The lease, lease management and lease distribution. In the past, I think we have um, broad time when a company, they have advertisements out. So people were just calling, oh, I saw that you have an advertisement. You're selling this to, you know, duplex for like a, you know, $600,000. Where? Oh, where? Yes, where? <laughs> well, so that is a, like a, it's just Halloween things. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a post Halloween then. <laughs> but that's important that when people call in for some kind of advertisement, that is the way people try to drive more transaction or potential client thing. But leads is a little bit different. That means that you have a resource, but you're able to distribute them. And you have, as a broker, you have to be careful because why you're sharing more listening to that person, but not me, we are equal. So that's why a full time is a good time. I mean, you guys sign up and it just depends on if you're lucky enough, you will get several listings just on that few hours or you would just stay there whole day, but you end up with nothing. It's pretty fair. But more than that, some title company, they may provide you additional information or the commercial expert may provide you some more leads about the commercial information. Because nowadays, you know, you got to pay a pretty expensive dollars, 400 something. 500 something just for LoopNet, CoStar. I don't mean you have to share those information as a broker because supposedly every single agent should have their own account. But at least that you're sharing something that you know how to read the report is easier, how you can just make your transaction faster, how you can get a very useful data and that will help your business grow. So that is another way that you can help your agents to grow. And when they see, okay, your your broke your brokerage firm, well, you have a commercial division, and I'm like a commercial real estate uh, expert, or even I would like to step in 
then you will be my next choice because you have the resource. Even it's invisible now, but at least I know there's someone I can ask, someone I can just get more information. Okay, commission, compensation plan, fee structure. I think this is so important, but this is not the only things so important. People will ask you about a commission split. What's your plan about this? When I hit certain level, then I'll get a higher commission split. Fee structures, or maybe you get 100% commission, but you have to pay me that fee. So all the things is different, but it really depends on which market you're targeting. Facility equipments, location technology. Do you think that uh, the, a real estate firm, they must have a company, a physical address in order to be succeed? Absolutely, right. But do we have some company, they, they're like a like hybrid? A PO box. A PO box, yes. A PO box, or we have an office somewhere like we call share space, like a workspace. You can just rent for a few hours. That is an, an, another office, alternatively. But it is, it is not a permanent settled company. So this is important for some agents. When they realize, okay, the, the cyber world won't work for me. Even if like a re, more like a remote after pandemic, but people still need a facility, you know, to show this is my place, this is my office, this is my, you know, I'm like a top, Seller. So I'm a top, uh, top uh, salesperson, so I have a typical here. So that is a showing, uh, you know, some part of your capability. Performance management and development. That you want to make sure that you are able to provide them. It's like I'm watching you. I'm giving you more classes. Make you, your, your knife is sharp with my support, with my coaching. So that's a little things will make a difference. So the agent wants to move. They just do not have a, you know, a good reason or they are not brave enough, not motivated enough to move. And you've got to think about why should someone to work with you? What's, why you're so special? Why there are so many companies, hundreds for them to choose from, but why they should choose you? You've got to have your own value. So you have to ask yourself, what makes you and your company so different? Are you paying better? Well, maybe, or maybe not, but we have some other things that you might think of. So what value will gain by being with your company? For example, anyone here is CIPS? We should have many, right? But CIPS is another network. I mean, when you are working in this market and you know the multi-languages requirement, then your, your, your company is able to, you have more diverse on different backgrounds, agents, then they are able to speak different languages. You can team up with them. This is another great resource. So what do you and your company have or do that can help your agents make more money. So how you can provide. So you have to make something a little bit different. It just sim simply as an agent. We have so many agents, 400,000 in South, in all California. So why your customer would choose you to be their agent, listing agent or selling agent? Because you're so different. Have your in-house mortgage lender? Um, once upon a time. Once upon a time. Wow, <laughs> the story tells, right? Well, but will in-house mortgage lender help? Usually, um, yes. Okay, so personal experience here, and I'm a little embarrassed to share this, but um, when when I worked for a one-stop shop office that had their own lender, had their own escrow, had own this and this and that, um, we were kind, we were as realtors encouraged to use all the in-house. Right. So there's a trust form that they're going to take care of you a little bit extra better in the sense that um, you're putting your trust in their hands and they're going to not defy you. 
So fast forward, we used an in-house lender and it was a bad loan. And when we consulted a truth and lending attorney, then our um, broker said, you're not being charged for the loan. So use it. Uh, it's a benefit for being, you know, working here. So what ended up happening was the um, the, the commission was charged on the back of the loan with us without being disclosed to us. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's good that you don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it, can we force our agents to use certain loan lenders? We can't, but this is a good resource that, okay, we are able to provide you additional options. Just in case you got disapproved from other places, we still have some backup for you. That could be the way, but we cannot force our agents to say, you must use this lender. This is my brother. We can't, just like Astro. Right. Some, some company, they have a great- And attitude. the referral fee should be disclosed. Of course, of course, that is a, that's a must. I'm so glad I just can deliver the speech right after DRE. <laughs> well, but then, I mean, then you, you got to tell people why you're so different. I mean, what resource you can get from this office. The access to on-demand on administration support, in-house marketing and graphic department. Is your company doing a flyer for your agent? Yes. Do they need to pay for it? No. no. Wow. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. No, 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 right? I mean, so that, that makes the things a little bit different because I know that some company, they will start with giving you like 10,000, 20,000 free postcards and mailed off for you when you join them. So and that is... A bonus. Yes. So that's a bonus. So this is a good technique when you are trying to recruit agents and you want them to be like loyal to your your, your company with my company logo and announce that you are now in a new territory, you're in a new venture, send it to someone that you know. If you don't know, we just do the mailing for you. So that is another prospective for free. And that is a very good incentive, right? And, and Jonathan, hey, uh, part of the benefit of working with Grand Club is knowing the tools. Knowing the tools that you have on hand, because if mm -hmm. you know the tools, you know what product you have available to be um, more serviceable to your, to your client. Exactly. I mean, so marketing tools that you are able to provide to your agent, that is another plus. They would say, oh, at least I know that you guys are making a good flyers here. So they don't have to deal with all their own. I mean, even we have AI right now, but I would say, you know, AI doesn't have those experience like we do. So we are able to have an expert to create some good templates and just for them to use. So when they do an open house, we have a support for them. That is a that is a plus. And the in-house PC that we just mentioned, reimbursement training and designation and certification. I think most of the company that will start with their uh, real estate school, when you passed, when you got your first salesperson license, they will just reimburse you with the tuition, a couple hundred dollars. But is that enough? No. No. Actually, you will be asked for more. At a time when I start my career in 2020, 2002, that I thought that that would be the, that would be it. When I get a license, I can do anything I want. Well, which is true. I can just handle all the transactions, residential, commercial. But then you realize it's not enough because you have to learn something is more special. You can just get a designation, the CIPS, CRP, ABR, you know, CRF, everything. So you know, this is just a key, allow you to access to the world of real estate. Then once you become a, a part of real estate, you've got to escalate it yourself. That is a part of the training, you know, designation, certification. Some company, they do provide the free tuition. If you can just hit certain level of transaction, we will pay you for this tuition for $1,000. So that is a good incentive too, because while they've been trained, they get an incentive from you, they appreciate it, and they will just keep working for your company because you are the right broker 
that make them grow. So we talk about the brands, your company, you know, you have a, a good brand. That is awesome. If not, global connection. Do you know someone that is with a, like a huge database of foreign buyers? You speak the language that from that place, you have a global connection. You have a great location of your office. Your size is about right. I know 400 is great. Sometimes they said 20, 20 agent is good enough because they said, well, all 20 of them, they are high produced. But John, also, mm -hmm. out of those 400, probably um, maybe 50% are filtered. Yeah. Because they're not going to go out and find Oh, you have part time? We have part time. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. I didn't know that real estate can be a part time. It's not a part time. <laughs> they, they want. <laughs> it, is not. it is not. I mean, let's, let's be honest, we have our country brothers. We have, you know, people that, that that don't need to work or it's a hobby. You hear everything. Really? Yeah. Just a hobby, right? Yes. Yeah, I don't need to work, so I'm here. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, that's fine. I mean, I understand that, but I mean that you you need to encourage them to start work. You know, they, they're not here just to have a tea, you know, enjoy the, you know. Well, well, when somebody Netflix. tells you, I've been doing this for 30 years, mm -hmm. the question is, not how many sales you have. The question is, what is that? Well, you reverse the question. When somebody says, I've been doing this for 30 years, well, what does those 30 years mean to you? Oh, yes. Right? Does it mean you're not taking education classes? Does it mean you're... You're sailing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, is, what does that mean? I had somebody who said to me, I've been doing this for 40 years. And I said, sir, what does that mean? He said, I haven't sold any houses in 40 years. Well, if you ask the same question to all our audience here, <laughs> they may have all different answers for you. <laughs> However, I think this is important. That is the value you created for this firm. You know, at the beginning, you create this firm because you want that everyone just recognize you as a great broker that I can work for. Yeah. But after 10 years, they may have something different because time change, if you stay in the same place, you still keep the same value, the same mission, which is fine. But your visionary should change or even go further. Then you are allowed, a, you know, your agents that have a new target to follow after that. Well, we, don't, then, we, don't, we don't treat our agents it's like agents. We treat our agents as there are children. And oh. children, when you bring up your child, you bring up every child different. Yes, because nurture. They're, they're, they're all different. Right. They're all different. So one might need more attention than the other one. The other one might need more attention. Mm -hmm. So in our office, we don't treat them as you're an agent and that's all you are. Yes, correct. Well, I'm lucky. I just have one child. <laughs> so, but I understand that. I mean, because when you treat people and family member. That is different from um this is a guideline. Yeah. Yes. So you're more customized, right? Yeah. yeah. Well that is important because this is about people and people. This is a business, not just a machinery. That you're producing, okay, just just make a phone call, that's it. And I just buy you some cheap, you know, pizza so you guys can just do it all night long. <laughs> no, we want Mary Kate <laughs> Then this is important because the leadership is important. You've got to be a good leader in your, you know, brokerage firm. And uh, you're able, you're capable enough. And they know if you are not there, someone else can be a backup. Right. You cannot be like, I'm the only star in, you know, in the sky. Then if someday I will be out of vacation, sorry, you don't have any support anymore. So that's important. You've got to have someone so strong stay in your company. At our company, everybody's a star. Say it again. At our company, everybody's a star. Wow, there are four hundred stars there. Yes, we we make them feel like a star, like you're the only shining star. Because if if you um, help people feel important, then they're going to start acting important. Right. I mean, the people when they start to complain to the staff, saying, "What happened to the Wi-Fi here? I'm still watching the sky. You know, the the Netflix. It's just somewhere in the middle." So that means they're not producing. So this is not the value of the Wi-Fi speed. It's about that what you can provide them and make them feel they're they're proud of as a as a broker as a part of you. So 
if you have one, even one agent that is not following the code of ethics, they do something really unethical and you feel like, oh my God, you are not firing him, I will go. Does I'm that happen? Not, on, hire. on hire, yes, I'm sorry. On hire. You're correct. So this is so to managing the, the firm is not just about right or wrong, but you have to know why. Right. And, that, and, and you know, at the end of the day, if an agent is doing something wrong, then it also falls on the manager and the broker. Right. So the manager and the broker are also doing something wrong. True. Yeah, because you're not supervising them, right? So this is important. If you want to hire someone to your company, you've got to interview them. Right. You know, in Chinese, there's one word saying that whatever the vegetable you pick up in your basket, that is a vegetable. That means you don't select. You don't select people. You just see whatever. There's an agent. There's unhousing agents. Come here. Okay, I'm here. So the quantity doesn't mean quality. You've got to so be selective. You cannot just choose whatever on the street and you see, oh, your licensing, just come. Because you may want to take the advantage. You have your relatives, your friends. Someday you will make a deal. You're 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 praying for something is not released, you know, it's uncertain. But this is not solid. And you have to choose one. If you have ch ever chosen one really horrible agent that is not followed, that, you know, the portico, you know, code of ethics, then bring you a lot of trouble. Then you're, you know, then you are actually kick out more agents that is so capable out of your office. So, your leadership style matters. Let's talk about a little bit uh, the you know recruiting process. I cannot cover all of them because it's just less than an hour. I don't know what time is it now. Do we have call? <laughs> Two fifteen. Okay, let me have another like a maybe ten minutes to fifteen minutes. But that's so you need to connect. Everything in your goal, when you talk to people, you got to bring something, uh, not, not just about a breath, but you also want to listen to them. You got to know why they want to move. If they are able to talk to you, that means they don't, they're not happy about their company now. No matter what that reason is, they have a something hidden in their heart. I want to move, but just not a right company yet. So you've got to bring something to them and say, okay, this is what I can do for you, but I need to know what you need first. So then, I mean, this is about the process. So you have to listen. So start with your profit goal. You've got to set up a goal. So what profit, what profit do you expect at the year end? So how you calculate the profit? For example, you're going to spend a lot of money paying people out. I have a an office, and that's like a six thousand per month. So that is overhead, electricity, utilities, triple net, then uh, maybe two receptionists, uh, something you know like a coffee machine. Everything costs money. So what profit do you expect at the year end? You will see. Okay, the agents I'm recruiting is way not enough to cover all the cost. But you have to know where you need to spend money to at the beginning. So what cost to run your company? That is the cost. You you know, you guys pay for it. Every single transaction you have to pay for it. But here is a little formula for you to see. You have to set a goal first, but you need to know the overhead cost, source of income, average sales price, average commission rate, because the rate that can make your revenue different and average company dollars. So let's say if average company money per transaction is 2,437, that is uh, the split. After the whole transaction pies and you got that portion, each transaction average, then you have three agents. Average number of transactions, each agent is three. So each agent, Estimated value will be 7311 
So we use this number times the number of agents you recruit. That will be an, your annual goal. So you can get 51,000 something. So that is pretty simple math, very simple math. But you will see it's not enough. This is for one year, right? So how many more than you're able to cover your whole cost as a manager, as a broker owner? So once you hit the 10, that is most difficult. Then you from 10 to 20, that will be easier. So it will be getting easier and easier to get because you have more pool that people will just start sharing your story, sharing the reputation what you have, the support that you're, you're providing to the agents. So you will getting easier and easier when you hit like higher uh, numbers of agents in your office. But, but we have to think about as a broker owner. So your struggle with, are you following up with those agents that say no to you? And sometimes you're just losing the tracks of leads. You don't remember that. You say no, no, no is no, that's okay. And you feel overwhelmed. That is the most of the time the broker will feel that way. Yes. There's so many things. We don't count any family issues. You know, your wife is not yelling at you. Your kids is not crying over there, but you are talking about the companies, the people and people. The relationship may be really tense. They're not happy about your, your management. They're not happy about another agent is not performing. So they said, you've got to call their broker and complain. You have all the things to manage. Do you still have time to do your own real estate business? If you can, you're strong. But most of the people will feel like overwhelmed. It's too much for them because the time management is not good enough for them. So that starts with like, a if you want to like a recruit new agent, you, you want to support a new agent then. The new agents will sell like less than three properties each year or last year. You definitely will spend more time with them, right? Because you're not, you've got to teach them why you're not producing. Let me find out the problem. You probably don't tell you're so lazy. You watch too much Netflix. You should really motivate yourself better. Are you endorsing Netflix? Well, <laughs> they didn't pay me for for sure. But uh, I mean, I, I I have heard about you know a lot of the story that the you know the agents is not you know not Netflix than YouTube <laughs> everywhere or TikTok I guess. But if they you're hiring like a people there so new they don't really have a good productivity you need to spend more time with them. So that is the reason why usually the beginner will be charged more, you know, portion of the, the split. So more than few agents at a time, you will spend more time on that. And if you don't have the resources to line that trend of new agents, please don't recruit them because you don't have time to do deal all the agents so new, they, they should be sent to some school and just do some basic training before they can start. It's just like a sushi man, right? You cannot touch the fish. You can only cook the rice first, then just cook the rice. Until you are so good at cooking the rice, you can start doing something else. So that is like step by step. Then you will start with supporting some mid-level agents, which means they're doing okay. And this is a, the population that you should be focusing on because they are so, they're more easier. Think about to switch to a new company. So these agents tend to be like a maybe eight to 20 transactions per year. Well, they have the basic idea. They do have the basic pool. They have a good technique. You know, you can provide them some good website. They, you know, they even have a good customer relationship management tools. But this, this part of people in your company, they are easy to be recruited as well. If you are managing well enough. They will say, you know what? I don't like to start, stay with Mark. You know, I would like to go somewhere else. Where are they? <laughs> but where are they? <laughs> well, until a better company come, shows up, right? But here is the things. If you're, this is the most difficult part as well, because when you're recruiting the top sales agents, they will have more attitude. They are more aggressive. They are more eager on commission things. So, this is why you want them. You're more like begging them, please come to my company. Because when you come, that means we guarantee have some income. 
don't beg. You don't beg, right? <laughs> I mean, most people would watch it. Oh, please come. But I mean, don't bet. You're right. The perceptions is they are so demanding and not really reasonable sometimes. So most company they want top producer. Of course, I mean, if you can hire five top producer, why you want to hire another one hundred new agent, right? So does this make them like demanding more unreasonable? If you stop begging them, yes, they will. So just don't do it. I mean, you, you need a good agent and you evaluate them, provide what they need. But it's not just about the, about the commission. Don't change your commission plan just because of this. This is important. Don't answer. Please. So at what point, does a top producer stop asking for more commission? You know Sometimes, what? at what point does a top producer stop asking for more commission? For okay. example, hmm. you have a top producer already, I'm going to just throw a number out there. This is a hypothetical number. If they're already making 99%, mm -hmm. then what's it going to give if they're giving 100%? I will be covered that in the next Perfect. Here. Right. Because this is, this is, you know, even just one transaction, they will feel, oh, you know what? I closed this this deal. And yeah. this deal that helped the company to make like a, maybe 40, 40 grand. Yeah. I deserve a better commission to sleep. And then they start holding you hostage. Yes. So it doesn't matter is how many. It just depends on if different people, they may have different you know, attitude. Yeah. But some people, they would just different say, values. you know, I have done this. It's yeah. so difficult to close. So I'm experienced now. I'm brand new and top agent now, please. I need a better commission split. They will ask you anytime. They will open the dialogue anytime they want. Okay, so there's an opportunity for leadership role in a company. So that is another one that you just ask because you, you're not giving them any better commission. They're getting, they getting good volume of the transactions. What do they need? They need a better title. For example, this is a good opportunity. Okay, how about that? Have you seen a lot of like a commercial real estate broker or agents? They have like a very strong title. Even they're just their salesperson licensee, but it will show vice president of this company. How many vice presidents? We have 399. <laughs> <laughs> For example, I'm just kidding, but but that is a that is another good way to keep them there. And Impressive title that will just put on their business card. It's important. I'm the vice, vice, you know, president in this firm. Ability to be trained or mentor. That means they are able to become like a share, sharing more benefits or revenue from other people in their team. You can start the little team there. This is the league one, league two, league three. You're the team leader. Please help them out. Now you are not mafia. At least that you are the leader of the team, and whatever they generate, you got some pie from them. That is another way. Access to a better system and tool. So usually they will say, "Okay, how about that? Let me pay you the co-star fee, monthly four hundred ninety-five dollars. Would that be a good one? Not bad. Absolutely. We need a search engine, and we are paid. Even they make a very good fortune. But if you're able to pay something." You said, you know what? My company will purchase a corporation uh, account. So we are able to provide you a lower price or even free uh, co star assets. You don't use the word, the word that you not appreciate it. You're correct. I, I, I agree with that. But I mean, that is something that you can yeah. show your respect. Yes. Okay. I'm so sorry. Am I, uh, I'm so behind, right? So let them know that you appreciate having that in your company. Yeah, don't don't take that as granted. So, you know, you got yours, I got mine. So that's just business business. We are family. Don't make that, you know, become a very cold, no, like a atmosphere. You got to make the atmosphere warm enough and keep them, retain those agents. So promote their accomplishment on social media. I don't know how much you worry about the social media. Do you care about social media? Well, Facebook, you know, yeah. Nobody, you know, but for younger generation, that's important. 
So that is a by generations and generations. Oh, we're I have to tell you though, John, social media is more measurable on your return. Okay. Because the uh, social media, how many people they are so good on social media that they're able to generate more income? Yes, you feel that, right? Yeah. People see the TikTok and they go, oh my God, this is an expert. I want to contact him just for this question, that question, and you will become a fan. And I mean, that is a, a great way, but you need someone to teach them a good technique. And then you need to build up your compensation plan. You know, you have to consider an upfront joint bonus. The joint bonus is not just those cards anymore. you got to give them something. It's like a more attractive. Okay, but don't modify your plan. I mean, because if you modify that, it will become, it's not a sp stabilized company. You're making some exception for this, for that. It's not really showing a good attitude as uh, running them down. Right, right. So don't change the compensation plan or model just for top, you know, to accommodate top producer. So we do have a lot of classes. I mean, as a CRP, we have 10 different classes. So show me the money compensation planning or how you start the strategy of building up your company. We do have those classes. So it's time to say goodbye because I have like another like 200 slides you know, after this, but I know the time is so short. Uh, is there any question I can answer you? After this, thinking about to become a broker of your own? It's true. More liability. That is an issue. But I mean, when you are capable enough, I mean, you are, you, you feel that you don't want to just a, a super money generator yourself. You want to have a, a team that can make the whole, you know, empire a bigger. Then this is a this is a good way to do it. So if you don't have any question, I mean, oh yes, yes, yes. Go ahead, go ahead, please. In the company, of course. I mean, why not? It's, it's a thing. How to run a vacuum, what form to use, how to do a phone call, join up, all these things. Usually, the company, they you, they have one coach and to teach all of them. Like a newer agent, they can just have like a weekly meeting. They do those uh, training. They, they will just repeat that, repeat that, you know, every week. So that, that should be the way. But one-to-one -one mentor is more not realistic because you cannot just put so much time on one person and your time should be using to recruit more agents instead of mentoring. Right. So you have to make the time as short as possible on training or you hire, or maybe you have another, like a top sales that are able to, to, to handle that part of work. But you have to clarify yourself, like make yourself available to outreach to those, you know, agents who wants who was thinking about switching to another company instead of asking a question i'd mm -hmm. like to maybe help you with that so um so what we do at our company is when we have a listing is we hold a camp we ask the seller for permission to have a training camp at the listing and then we bring in the newer agents in and mentor them and we have the seller cooperate with them and then they get evaluated. Yeah, okay. okay. Well, but thank you so much for today. I really appreciate for your time, and I hope you learned something. This is this is not just a course, but this is just sharing uh, the experience that you know. I really appreciate that you're. See you again. Oh yeah. So next up, we have a really really awesome person. Uh, I I I've actually kind of stumbled with words how to introduce him because Jim Clinker has helped us out a lot. And he has a wealth of legal knowledge that he's going to share with us. I can just, I mean, I just really want to quickly go down. He's worked in um, many of the federal forms, commercial forms, construction, employment, title, contracts, escrow, business, partners, shareholder disputes, worker liability, professional malpractice, a lender liability, commercial transaction, estate, elderly abuse, uh, broker and contract license. Um, proceedings, wrongful death, and major personal injuries. Uh, Jim has graduated from Loyal Law School in LA. 
and uh, he was a former real estate practice uh, broker, so he has, he's talking from experience. Uh, and he's been two decades as an advisor for the local realtor association and a member of the California Association of Realtors uh, Legal and Fair Forms. So, without further ado, let's let's give him let's give Jim a warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Uh, Thank you, Jim. The floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. It's good to see all of you again. Um, fair housing is kind of an interesting area of the law. It's one of those things. Oh, yes. We have... Oh, we need to be closer. Or we can take it off. There we go. Yeah, fair housing is one of those areas where you don't think much about it, but if you ever end up stumbling across a problem or an issue in fair housing, it can get to be a major problem in a hurry. And um, today we're going to be talking about some of the high points of fair housing law. Fair housing law, as we'll talk about, is really extensive. We could spend several hours going over all the nuances and intricacies of it. And one of the things you'll, you'll find out as we go through these things is there aren't always real clear answers to some of the problems you're going to be confronted with. But anyway, I, I thought we'd kind of do an overview of the main areas that are important in fair housing. And along the way, I'll share some of my insights and experiences from dealing with these issues as a lawyer with you. And hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end. If you have any questions, we can we can delve into those. So as I mentioned in the area of fair housing law, there aren't always real clear answers to things. Um, even the way the laws are written can be really troublesome. I went yesterday, I thought, you know, I probably ought to review the recently enacted uh, regulations under the Federal Employment or the Fair Employment and Housing Act. And read them cover to cover, and I, I was really astounded at how many different vague words came out of there. Things like concepts like reasonableness and unreasonableness. Um, a, a landlord may have an obligation to do something if it isn't an undue burden on the landlord, and uh, landlords have an obligation to prevent direct threats and respond to them. Those kinds of concepts are really nebulous, and it's very, very difficult when you're stuck in the position of being a, a an agent or a landlord or a property manager to know how to respond to, to individual problems. What's reasonable? What's not unreasonable? You know, what, what is an undue burden? And, and frequently you'll end up with situations where you have competing concerns. You may have a concern as a landlord of tenant safety. On the other hand, you may have a concern that if you properly take actions to protect your tenants, you may be accused of violating the fair housing laws. A lot of those kinds of situations come up where you're forced to more or less pick your poison and make decisions on things. Um, the cost of guessing wrong can be really extraordinary. If you're faced with a situation where there's a possible fair housing complaint coming in your direction and you don't respond to it in a prudent manner, you can end up with all kinds of things happening to you. You can have, you can have the civil rights department pursue a complaint, a disciplinary complaint against you. You can have the Department of Real Estate chasing after you. Um, you can end up in a civil lawsuit where civil rights violations are asserted. And those kinds of lawsuits can really get out of hand in a hurry over seemingly simple things because you get lawyers involved, many of whom are representing the money more than they are their client. They have an incentive to build up their fees because fees are recoverable in, in cases involving civil rights violations, fair housing violations. So I have an example here in San Francisco, a landlord a couple of years ago agreed to pay a million dollars in damages. And the underlying complaint was the landlord refused to provide a more, a more accessible parking space to a single tenant with a disability. And I don't know what the details of that, how it played out were, that my guess is that's probably a situation that could have been handled early on and probably nipped in the bud. It didn't happen that way. It played out all the way through and you had this incredibly seemingly unfair result on the face of it. But that's the kind of things that are in play when you talk about fair housing. There's several sources of primary law for fair housing, some federal and some state. There's the, on the federal side, there's the Federal Fair Housing Act. Then there's the Americans with Disabilities Act. I'm sure probably most, if not all of you are familiar with the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. If you get involved in any transactions, particularly for commercial or industrial property, frequently that's an issue, one of the due diligence things you're concerned with. In California, there's the Fair Employment and Housing Act in the government code. 
And then there's also a, a, an independent statute that covers a lot of the same things, but in some ways goes further called the Unruh Civil Rights Act. Whereas the Fair Employment and Housing Act covers a laundry list of various types of protected classes of people that you can't discriminate against. The Unruh Civil Ra Rights Act takes it one step further and basically makes it unlawful to, to discriminate against anybody for any arbitrary reason, whether or not they've been recognized as a protected class. So, for example, I'm a lawyer. People may not want to do business with me as a lawyer. Um, under the Fair Employment and Housing Act and the regulations, they probably don't have to because lawyers aren't a protected class. But arguably, under the UNRU Civil Rights Act, I might be protected because that would be an un basically an arbitrary discrimination against me. Then uh, at a regulatory level, you've got the Real Estate Commissioner's regulation, and in particular, Regulation 2780. It's worthwhile to pull that up, do a quick Google search, pull it up and look at it. It lists as grounds for discipline any kind of discrimination against mostly the recognized protected classes in California. But it goes on it, in some length as to detailing all the things you can't do without running afoul of the real estate law. And then one of the newer developments in fair housing law we'll talk about is the, there's new regulations that were proposed for several years concerned a lot of people because of the potential breadth of the regulations. Finally, they went effective. We, they were officially promulgated in January of 2020. And they're not as bad as a lot of people had feared, but they do provide guidance in a lot of areas. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. As far as how all these laws relate to each other, they tend to overlap considerably. Uh, the federal law overlaps with the state law. Some of the state laws overlap with each other. And, and the basic rule is if you're dealing with a situation that involves fair housing implications, whatever body of law is most protective of the protected class is the body of law that's going to control. And most of the time in California, if you've got a fair housing issue, it's going to be California law that's most stringent in providing protection to the public. So typically, I mean, in most situations, if you're cool under California law, you're going to be fine under federal law as well protected in California, I'm sure most of you are aware of, of the, the main protected classes in California. Every time I give this talk or deal with an issue having to do with fair housing, I have to go back and refresh my recollection. And every time I look at the list, it grows. So and there's some fairly recent ones. Uh, the obvious ones we've been familiar with for years, race, color, religion, national origin and ancestry, sex and gender, marital status, disability, family status, age. Age is kind of an interesting one because there are laws built in that are, tend to be protective of senior citizens that don't constitute discrimination. So in some limited situations, it's okay. In fact, it's required to discriminate in favor of senior citizens. Medical conditions, a protected class. All this used to fit on one screen. I had to split it out into two screens now. Genetic information, such as DNA and what have you. If somebody were able to find out what your DNA is and get information like that and try to discriminate against you based on that, they'd be running afoul of the law. Sexual orientation, primary language, that's one of the relatively newer protected areas. Military or veteran status. And I always have a typo in my uh, presentation somewhere buried that I don't see until I'm actually talking, and there it is, military. But uh, that, that's a fairly new classification of protected person, military or veteran status. That that was added in January of 2020. Source of income is a tricky one. Obviously, as a landlord or a property manager, you have to be aware of the tenant's ability to pay the rent that you're agreeing to. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing your job and you run out of business pretty quickly. But you have to be really careful not to consider what the source of that income might be. The amount of income is still a legitimate inquiry, as we'll talk about. The source of that income is not. And then lastly, a few more recent ones, immigration or citizenship documentation or status. Um, as I mentioned, arbitrary, arbitrary discrimination against anyone would be under the UNRU Act. And then the last couple, then probably the most recent, you can't discriminate against an individual who's perceived to be a member of a, of a protected class. So if somebody looks like they might belong to a protected class, even if they actually aren't a member of that class, they're still entitled to protection. And then even further than that, any individual associated with any member 
of a protected class has as a protection. What conduct is prohibited? Obviously, if you refuse to sell rent or lease to somebody who's a member of a protected class, that's a pretty obvious one. That's going to be a violation of the law. Any discriminatory rental terms and conditions, that would be a violation. You can't charge or quote a price to one person because of their affiliation and then turn around and quote a different price to somebody else because they're a member of one of the protected classes. Um, discriminatory advertising, discriminatory statements regarding availability of housing, discriminatory conduct after a tenant takes occupancy. Th those are all fairly obvious things. You also, you have to be careful not to be perceived as retaliating against somebody for exercising their fair housing rights. If you've got a tenant who files a fair housing complaint against you, you can't turn around the next day and start making life miserable for that tenant where you're going to compound your problems severely. And then another type of conduct that is really covered under fair housing laws is the, the obligation to allow for reasonable accommodation or modifications to people with disabilities. And if you refuse to allow those modifications and accommodations, that can be a violation of fair housing laws. And even it's not just enough to avoid violating the laws. In some situations, affirmative conduct is required on the part of an agent or a landlord or a property manager. Um, for example, a landlord may be required to assume reasonable financial burdens to accommodate a disabled tenant. And that, there's that word reasonable. Somebody comes to me with a problem like this and says they have a tenant who's approached them requesting accommodations. What's reasonable? I can't tell them what's reasonable. We can look at what's what some courts have declared to be reasonable in certain situations, and, and we can use common sense, but it ends up being a judgment call in these situations as to what you have to do. Whether if, if you're if you're required to do something that's reasonable, we've got to figure out what reasonable is. Um, another example is a landlord may be required to alter their administrative policies to accommodate a disabled tenant's inability to generate income. It might be that a particular tenant gets some assistance of some sort on a, on a certain day of the month. That tenant might request that you adjust your rent schedule. So rent isn't payable on the first of the month, for example. Maybe it's payable on the 20th because that fits better with the type of income that that disabled person has. So those kinds of things are, are might be required under the fair housing laws as well. Yeah. Yes, Cecile. I think that's a well, that, that could be a fair housing law. It could be a situation outside the fair housing laws we're talking about, but I think it would be prudent for uh, the landlord to take care of that situation as quickly as possible. You get into some subtleties there about whether or not, if a tenant doesn't bring it to the attention of the landlord, with what's the implication there? And obviously the tenant uh, under some of our laws has an obligation to cooperate with the landlord's effort to remediate the situation. But I, I would get on that because that, that sounds like a lawsuit coming. <laughs> <laughs> are you the manager thank goodness i was gonna say that might that, that might be a management account you want to send packing <laughs> uh, that that's that should be taken care of may i say something yeah sure it kind of almost sounds like a, a common sense thing for the housing provider to accommodate i mean if the person is blind that's so that's so great. Yeah, a lot of this stuff we're talking about does kind of come down to common sense. And a lot of it comes down to just looking ahead a little bit into the future and trying to assess what, what might be coming if you act in a certain way or don't act in a certain way. And one of the, one of the most important things, if you're ever faced with a, with a threat of a fair housing complaint or initiative, same thing holds for a DRE complaint too. You, you want to immediately start wanting to act. You want to start acting carefully about that because everything you do and say is kind of building a 
record either help you down the road or or basically kill you down the road. Else you write any anything you tell somebody on a telephone, even though it may not be taking notes, anything like that, you got to really start watching. Once you're on notice that you may have an issue coming at you, you got to be more careful. The, the way the way these fair housing violations can hit the landlord or an agent are varied. Um, one of the things that I've run across that it can be an affirmative defense in an unlawful detainer proceeding. Tenants not paying their rent seems like a simple thing. We can give them a three day notice, start getting them out. All of a sudden, as an affirmative defense, they're claiming violations of, of the fair housing laws and refusal to negotiate reasonable accommodations, that type of thing. And depending on what court you're in and what judge you're in, that can get to be a real problem. I, I've had evictions derailed for several months by somebody asserting that they're actually the title holder and the landlord doesn't hold title. And, and in some situations, you have to actually stop the eviction, take the whole thing to superior court, have a trial on the quiet title claims and get that resolved before you can proceed. Same thing holds true for fair housing issues. Um, in, in civil cases alleging violations of the fair housing laws, you can be liable for monetary damages. And importantly, a lot of times the monetary damages, the economic damages aren't always that severe, but a problem is that you can also be liable for the complaining party's pain and suffering. And under California law, there aren't any clear limits on the extent of those potential damages. The jury instruction that the jury's given in a case that involves pain and suffering of a plaintiff just tells the jury to use your common sense. There are no guidelines. And what's common sense for one jury might be craziness for another jury. So whenever you've got a situation where you're exposed to pain and suffering damages, that could be a big number, even if the underlying problem isn't that significant economically. Um, probably the biggest thing driving civil cases involving fair housing violations is the potential to be liable for the other party's attorney's fees and costs. And attorneys out there who represent fair housing claimants are aware of that. They'll take the case, they'll work, work it to death, run up a huge tab of hourly fees, and they're hoping that they're going to get those to stick. And what happens, those usually aren't asserted during the trial. After a trial, if a fair housing violation complaining party is successful, they'll make a motion in court to be awarded their fees. And the numbers could, act, they, they might actually shock you, some of the numbers you might see. Low to mid six figures is not uncommon in a fair housing violation case. And that would be absolutely ruinous to a lot of people. Um, you can end up with injunction relief asserted against you if you're in the property management business or if you're a landlord, you might have a court order requiring you to refrain from doing something or requiring you to do something. That's called a mandatory injunction. You can end up being the subject of government investigation and prosecution. That can be an expensive thing to endure. And then lastly, if the Department of Real Estate tags on, which they're known to do, um, you may end up with your license suspended or revoked. And one, one of the ways the Department of Real Estate these days is going after people is they will wait and see if you're accused of violating any other agency's regulatory scheme, they'll sit back and watch, keep an eye on it, and they will come in and assert under one of the Business and Professions Code provisions that the violation of another law is actually a violation of the real estate law, and they'll go after your license for that. So there's a whole bunch of reasons to be careful when you have fair housing situations that arise. One of the areas that you have to be careful in is when you're screening tenants. That's where a lot of these claims come about. Um, you've got to, obviously, if you're a reasonable landlord or a diligent property manager, you need it to find tenants who will pay their rent, who will take care of the premises, not interfere with other tenants, comply with the laws and with the landlord's reasonable rules. So. But you've got to be careful when you're looking for that person not to run afoul of the fair housing laws because it's easy to, to take one misstep and all of a sudden you've got a problem on your hand where somebody's making a, a tenable claim that you're discriminated against them. So the, the best way to do that, you want to have uniform screening procedures that you really don't vary from. You should have a set of things that you look at with respect to every tenant. And then in those procedures should be set up in such a way they should be designed to accomplish the legitimate purposes of finding tenants 
who will be responsible in paying the rent and will take care of your property. The, the acceptable things you can look at when you're screening tenants without having a problem with the fair housing laws is it's certainly okay to look at their credit rating. It's okay to look at their employment history. Um, you can look at their amount of income, but again, not the source of income. If somebody's got a source of income from a from a partner or a spouse or something that they're cohabiting with, you have to allow that to be considered. You can't say, well, that might not be reliable. Um, you got to basically have to look at income without regard to what the source of the income is. Personal references are okay to look at. Rental history is okay. You can subscribe to a service that looks at these people have ever been evicted or been a party to an unlawful detainer proceeding. You can look at past bad conduct that's relative to relevant to the safety of other tenants, but that's where you get into kind of a real gray area. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit more. When you're looking at criminal history, there, there are cases out there and situations where people will complain that by, by having too rigid screening in place with regard to prior criminal history, you're actually, in, in a hidden way, you're discriminating against certain groups of people. If, if a certain group could, could just show that they are more likely to have been arrested, for example, than another group, and you're somehow screening tenants based on the fact whether or not they've ever been arrested, for example, that could be a problem for you. So again, the, the best way to lessen the exposure in the area of screening is just to have a, a uniform application and screening procedure that is reasonably related to your legitimate, legitimate objectives. There is the concept in fair housing law of disparate impact, and that, that applies across the board. It also applies in employment situations as well. The landlord or a property manager may have a policy that on the face of it looks like it's non-discriminatory and perfectly okay. It's legitimate. It's designed to meet one of the legitimate objectives a landlord or property manager might have. But if you dig a little bit deeper, an argument might be able to be made that that policy is actually discriminatory against one or more groups of protected classes. For example, and I've got a couple examples here. A, land, a landlord might have a policy, I'm not going to consider renting to anybody whose income isn't at least three times the amount of the monthly rent. Sounds like it might be reasonable in one sense because it's going to get rid of a lot of people who are probably going to be late making their rent payments or not be able to make them. On the other hand, you might have a group come forward and say, hey, you know, the group I belong to, we have, we tend to have a history of lower rent or lower income than other groups, but we may still be able to pay our rent and you're discriminating against us because we're a member of that group. Um, criminal violations I mentioned, I've got another example here, that could have a disparate effect on some groups. Um, they may say, well, the, the particular protected class I belong to tends to have more run-ins with the law. And if you're going to look carefully and screen people out because of any prior criminal conduct, that might unfairly discriminate against me on the basis of my membership in a protected class. Some good news, fair housing laws as of yet have not been extended to roommates. If, you're, if you own a piece of property and you'd like to rent out a spare bedroom or something, you don't have to be concerned about somebody about rejecting somebody because they're a member of a protected class. Um, the courts have recognized that that is such a personal decision as to somebody you're actually going to be sharing a house with, for example, that they they tend to say that that's not a problem. I mean, you can you can select your tenant without regard to sexual discrimination or racial discrimination or anything of the sort. Yes. That could be a problem. Um, is that two yeah, we're we're no, we're we're going to touch on occupancy limits in a bit too. But since you bring it up, yeah, any any arbitrary occupancy limits are a potential problem. There, there's kind of a general guideline that the two plus the number of units is is okay, and nobody's going to look at you funny if you're adhering to that kind of policy. But there's also some more recent decisions and and. The trend more recently is that you can't even have that kind of arbitrary situation. You have to look at everything individually and decide. But yeah, I mean, that, that can be a problem. In, in many situations, it's found to discriminate against family status, and that's the protected class that it causes a problem for. Because you might have a, in fact, a lot of these situations, you potential for a complaint comes from members. In I bet you if we went around this room, 
every single one of you probably belongs to more than one protected class one way or another. You know, probably all of us, some, some of us might be several that have been found to be violative of the prohibition against discrimination. And, uh, Jim, if I may ask, yeah. if that protected class could be religion status as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Talking about criminal convictions, here's my, here's my screen on that. The, the tension in terms of criminal convictions is a real one. As a landlord, you can potentially be liable if, if you don't take reasonable steps to protect the health and safety of all of your other tenants. And so, at the same time, if you are being overly strict and overly restrictive about considering renting to somebody who has a prior criminal conviction, you can be accused of violating the fair housing laws. And you end up, once again, I mentioned pick your poison. That's one of these situations where you have to make a decision as to what the greater risk is for you and for the tenants you're responsible for. Um, if, if a landlord has a policy of anybody who has ever been convicted of a crime, whether it's a felony or misdemeanor or whatever, I'm not going to rent to them, that's going to be a problem. Sooner or later, somebody's going to pick up on that, get to a good lawyer who knows how to leverage the system, and you're going to end up with a big complaint on your hands. Um, but it, yeah, Brian. It's extremely vague. It, it doesn't have a good answer. It, it, it's any anybody who can who can. It's basically whatever you can sell to a jury that may or may not be very bright, <laughs> you know, and, and to a lesser extent judges, but still there, there's a big disparity in what happens. It's funny. So my, my favorite story about juries is that about 12 or 13 years ago, I had a case where I represented a woman in a in a financial elder abuse claim and we took it through a jury trial and I got a million dollar verdict. It was a good case. We had good facts. It had some difficulties in the case, but still got a big, big verdict. Judge took it away from me. Said, "No, that's that's too big, too much money. That jury, they were too liberal in awarding money. I'm going to grant a new trial." So it worked its way through the system. I came back and tried that same case again three years later, different court, same county, but different courthouse, different jury. I thought I did a better job putting the case on. I thought my witnesses were more convincing and compelling. Got a goose egg. So that, that shows you the, how vague the whole jury system can be. But you've, I mean, the, the, the obvious problem is if somebody comes to you and they've been convicted of a minor drug offense three years earlier or something, it's a one-time thing, it would probably be imprudent to refuse to rent to them because of that, that situation. However, if you've got somebody who just a couple of years before was convicted of raping a young child, for example, and you've got a complex that has children in it, you'd be a fool to rent to that person. And those those are two extreme examples, but the, where it gets to be difficult is where in the middle do you, does everything get worked out? And, and my thought in my extreme, my last extreme example was I'll take my chances of a fair housing violation. I'm not going to put a young child in harm's way potentially by renting to some guy that has a history of doing that. And that that's such an extreme example. You'd probably be pretty well protected in that situation. I think most juries and most judges and most regulators would look at that and say, yeah, that's, I can understand why you wouldn't rent to that person. But there's a whole big sea of gray area in between those extremes. And it, it helps to have objective standards, but they, they can't be unreasonable. And, and if, you have, if you have too harsh a, a line drawn in the sand about criminal convictions or income or any of these screening categories, you can have a problem on your hand. So I've got some examples here. In terms of criminal convictions, probably the best policies, if you have a policy about prior criminal convictions and a prospective tenant, you'd want to limit it to recent criminal history. You wouldn't want to be looking at things that are 10 years old, for example. Um, and you'd want to limit it to serious crimes. So I would, I would say if you're a landlord, if you have a policy, you should limit it. Like you're going to look at criminal convictions within the last three or five years, for example. And you're going to look only at maybe certain felonies of a certain class, not look at misdemeanors, traffic violations, and that kind of stuff. Ability to pay rent, we touched on. It's perfectly okay. In fact, it's prudent for a landlord or property manager to screen tenants to see if they're going to be able to pay their rent. If you don't do that, 
you're not going to make the first month's rent payment. You're immediately going to be evicting them. And these days, you don't lose two or three months rent when you evict somebody. More often, it's like five or six months or longer sometimes. So it's it's a big decision to put somebody in one of your units. You want to have some reasonable assurance they're going to be able to pay the rent. But you got to be careful. You, you can't look beyond what the amount of the income is and look at the source of the income or you're going to end up with a problem on your hands. It's okay to run a credit check. It's okay to subscribe to a service that checks those things out for people. But uh, you got to be careful. You got to stop short of looking at the source of the income. Let's cover this minimum. <clears throat> you want to be careful not having arbitrary minimum income requirements. <laughs> and the problem is that some certain a, a group, of, a protected class of people might say that that's unduly discriminatory to them. There, there's been a, a fairly recent development in terms of source of income. Source of income has been protected for a while um, under the California Fair Employment and Housing Act. But effective January 2020, I, I know most of you are aware of this because it was pretty big headlines for, for quite a while back when it was first enacted. Effective January 2020, you can't refuse to rent or otherwise discriminate against a person because they have a housing subsidy, subsidy. The most commonly accounted one would be Section 8 vouchers, but there's also certain military vouchers that are available to veterans. You can't refuse. And that that's... That's a problem for landlords and property managers because there's an additional burden, administrative burden of dealing with Section 8 tenants and the things you have to do, but you still, you can't discriminate against them. Marital status, you, got, you can't discriminate based on marital status. Somebody's married, not married, if they're living with a partner and they're not married, any of that stuff is out of balance as far as decisions you make in terms of your brokerage practice, property management, or landlord. You might draw a complaint that you're discriminating against families by having them. That's another damned if you do and damned if you don't situation, because if you just look the other way and don't pay attention and a child's injured in your facility, you may get a, a civil lawsuit against you for that. I mean, I think in that situation that the answer is to have reasonable rules and restrictions about supervision and that type of thing and adhere to them. Yeah. I have a suggestion. What if he pulls the sign that says, um, no family affairs. It sounds like a marketing opportunity. That yeah. complex could be a lot of fun for certain people. Yeah. You might be able to raise the rents. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. In that situation, I, I I would look at it really carefully and look at where there's just a lot of considerations. Where Where is the complaint most likely to come from and how severe is it going to be from, from whichever direction it comes from? As long as they're both acting responsibly and, and seemingly it's consensual, I would steer clear of it. But if, if somebody comes and complains that they're being leaned on by another tenant, then you're you're really pretty well forced to take action. Mm -hmm. Think you'd be safe in that situation. I, I I don't think the source of income restrictions mean you can't look at the stability of the income in any sense. I think it means you can't arbitrarily discriminate against somebody because they're getting assistance from some other direction. I think in that situation, I, you'd be fairly safe in saying there's a problem. As far as family status, it extends beyond just protecting families with children. It extends to pregnant women, persons in the process of securing legal custody of a child, and even families with children who are guests of a housing facility. Complaints have, have been asserted on behalf of visiting families when their children couldn't use the pool, for example. So you need to be cognizant of that type of situation. We touched on occupancy standards. There's that kind of general rule that's been in effect for a long time, the, the general thought that the two plus the number of, two individuals plus the number of bedrooms you have is a safe harbor. Uh, probably still in most situations, but I wouldn't automatically consider that to be safe in all situations. It could be that you've got a unit that has extraordinarily large rooms and extraordinarily large bedrooms and if somebody wants to put more than that number of people in there 
you may have a complaint on your hands if you deny it. So you got to be a little bit sensitive to individual situations there. There are senior housing exceptions to the whole concept of family discrimination. Basically, for the certain types of projects that are set up, it's okay to limit it to certain groups of senior citizens. You can have a, a complex that's only limited to persons 62 years of age or older, or you can have a complex that's lim that limits people under the age of 55 to less than 20% of the total occupancy. And state and federal laws are pretty well aligned on most of those issues. Um, persons with disabilities, a big area, probably maybe the biggest area right now of complaints in terms of fair housing, both regulatory and civil and civil lawsuits. Um, you may be faced with a situation as, and I'm going to use the word landlord again, I guess I should be using property owner, but uh, a landlord and uh, or as an agent or as a property manager with somebody, a tenant who comes to you and says, I've got a problem, I have a disability, I need you to accommodate me. And if, if you ever, as a, as a property owner or property manager or or employer, if anybody comes to you and starts talking about accommodations or a need for assistance in some regard, the very worst thing you can ever do is to blow them off and say, no, we don't do that type of thing here. We're a small shop. We can't afford that kind of stuff. Never, ever, ever do that because I'll guarantee you, you're going to get served with the lawsuit or you're going to get served with the complaint from the government agency. And one of the allegations in there is going to be that you fail to engage in an interactive process. And those two words, interactive process, it's something you're required to do whenever one of these situations comes up where you're requested, you have a request for accommodations. Um, somebody might say, I can't get my, my wheelchair through your door. I need to expand it. I, I need, I can't walk long distances. I need to have a parking space much closer to my unit where I don't have to walk as far, that kind of thing. Um, and that gets into areas you have a duty to basically accommodate those requests to the extent it doesn't impose an unreasonable administrative burden or change the nature of how you do things. If you have a tenant who says, I have trouble getting around, landlord, I need you to drive me to the market. That's a, a huge expansion of your normal policies and procedures. It's going to be an expense. You don't have to go that far in accommodating them. But if it's something as simple as reassigning a parking space or doing something like that, pretty clearly you do have to do that. And in between those two extremes, there's, again, a whole sea of individual situations that have to be considered. And the first thing you want to do when you're when you encounter something like requests like that, don't blow them off. Say, I want to talk to you about that. If you need more information, get more information, but, but engage in a, in a process and have a record that you're listening to them and you're not just arbitrarily rejecting their claim as unreasonable or too expensive. And then once you establish that you're going to listen to them and, and engage in this process, then you may want to go out and get some assistance from somebody that specializes in these types of issues or talk to your lawyer or whatever, but then develop a game plan and figure out. But avoiding knee-jerk reactions is one of the best ways to avoid liability in most areas of the law. I, I, I almost never fire off an angry email. I, I, if somebody does something to me that really annoys me and irritates the heck out of me, I don't immediately respond. I'm going to stop and think about it. I might even think about it till the next day. I might talk to a couple of my law partners about it. I'm going to really carefully consider it before I go on record with any kind of a response. And then I'm, my response is typically not going to be anything inflammatory. It's going to be real low key because you're, you're creating evidence whenever you're responding. As soon as these situations start to arise, there's a body of evidence that's being created. And if you ever end up having to go to a trial or a regulatory hearing or anything like that, you want to have a good record behind you that makes you look like you're a reasonable person. You want to have a, a, a course of conduct that you've engaged in that you're proud of, that you're happy to go up there and share with people as to how you respond to the things. A few other examples. I'm running short on time here. I don't want to cut short Albert's time. So I'm going to hurry, hurry through some of the stuff you've got in the outline. Um, again, we've talked about reasonable accommodations and the interactive process. Support animals. That, that's an issue that still comes up quite a bit. I was hoping there would be more guidance in the, in the new regulations we have than there is. 
The new regulations touch on it, but they don't really add a whole lot that's new to the situation. Um, basically, there's there's two kinds there's two kinds of assistance animals. There's a service animal, which is a guide dog for blind people, or some, or a dog that helps people get around. And then there's a support animal. That's more of a loosey goosey category of, of of animals or pets that people need for their emotional security and what have you, but it's not directly related to some service that the animal provides. And if you're asked to accommodate that, so you may have a no pets policy and that's perfectly okay, but you can't, you can't insist that that no pets policy extend in all situations, even in the situations where the person may have a need for an accommodation for their disability. So there, there are even a no pets policy, policy has to have exceptions in some situations. Not an arbitrary limit. The new regulations that came out do have a little bit of help there. They they say that you know, one of the there's a cat there's a cottage industry that arose of people online saying we'll give you a certificate that you have a disability you need to have a support app. The regulations say now that a, a certification or a certificate from an online service that does not include an individual assessment from a medical professional is presumptively not not legitimate. So. You have that to rely on. That's that's some help, um, and you can also impose reasonable regulations. You can't you can't have a bright line rule. I'm not going to allow this certain type of dog, which is a problem sometimes with your insurance carrier potentially, because your insurance company may not want you to have Rottweilers and uh, you know pit bulls and and various breeds known to be dangerous. But under the fair housing laws, you can't have that arbitrary distinction. Um, but you can impose reasonable restrictions. You can say, yes, I will accommodate your request for a comfort dog, but if you're out in the complex outside your unit, you must have that animal on leash. That's that's reasonable. That's not going to get you in trouble. So that kind of thing. But but in arbitrary restrictions and limitations and denials of those things can, can be a real problem. That could be a you you would need to engage in the interactive process and you would very politely request information about why they need six cats, why five cats might not be enough. That You can make that kind of inquiry. What you can't do is you can't get into details, too many invasive details about the nature of the disability and what have you. That's, that's kind of, that goes too far. You have to kind of accept it if it's, if it's basically validated by their physician or some other reliable third person, you pretty much have to accept that. But the, but the response to it is certainly open to discussion. Somebody may may need an animal for for their emotional insecurities. That animal probably doesn't need to be a twenty foot long python, for example. So but that that's where. You, but again, you'd want to have the record that you engaged in an interactive process and you really considered what they had to say and didn't reject it out of hand. That's going to leave you in much better stead if you end up with a complaint. Yeah, that's that is generally okay. You, pet owners are not a protected class. Where you have to be willing to relax that policy, though, is if you have a tenant that does have a legitimate disability and they request an accommodation, a comfort animal, support animal of some sort. So it just can't be a hard and fast rule. That I had the, um, the tenant said, no, I do not have any pets. So then when she moved in, she had a pet and she said, it's not my pet, it's my child. <laughs> that, that raises a bunch of fair housing issues. That, that raises family familial discriminations, questions, you know, various things like that. So, and, and the fact that a tenant lied to you is significant too. I mean, that may not be, the problem is if you evict somebody because of that, they're going to say you didn't evict them because they lied to you, you evicted them because they're a member of this protected class and you're discriminating against them. So, and sometimes people lie, and sometimes people believe the lie. So you got to assess that risk factor in anything you do. We've talked, I'm going to wrap up here. We've talked about reasonable accommodations. We talked briefly about the Americans with Disabilities Act, gender protections, sex harassment and housing. We talked about that a little bit. There's two kinds of sex harassment out there, both in the workplace and in terms of provision of housing. And one is quid pro quo harassment. That's where you have a tenant who wants to trade sex instead of paying you rent. That that's very clearly quid pro quo harassment. Don't do that. That's going to almost certainly result in a claim and get you into major trouble. But but the more insidious type of sexual harassment out there, both in the workplace and in terms of provision of housing, is a hostile environment. And that, that's again kind of nebulous. We talked about that. Like the situation I had 
with with the guy running around. I would certainly say that's a hostile environment. The, the situation Vince brought up with you know that that's kind of a that could be a hostile environment. It could be a quid pro quo problem, depending on how it develops. But uh, and you you have an obligation as a provider of housing to somewhat police that. You can't allow. You certainly need to take steps to avoid quid pro quo harassment. If you've got one tenant really hitting hard on another tenant, that's a problem that you may need to address. But also, if it's just a hostile environment, if you got some guy that's just so foul mouth, it's beyond all all realm of reason. He's going around really offending other tenants and what have you. You may have an obligation to step in and do something about that as well. Domestic violence. There are some rules on that. There are a couple of statutes a few years ago that came out. The landlord can't terminate a tenancy specifically because of acts of domestic violence against a tenant. And a victim of domestic violence can break a lease. You know, the situation, if a, you have a tenant who's been the victim of domestic violence, you have to allow them out of the lease under certain circumstances. So that, that issue is out there. Who can assert a fair housing claim? Just about everybody under the sun. The person who's actually aggrieved, a testing agency, um, Various organization, organizations are set up, members of the same neighborhood, uh, just it goes on and on and on. So you're you're a target from a whole bunch of different directions once you engage in activity that could give rise to a fair housing violation. There's a real estate licensees. I mentioned you can eventually lose your license over a claim, you, uh, typically if it's egregious. Um, you've got sometimes a problem that I've seen come up more than once is an agent has a client who basically directs them to violate the fair housing laws. They may say, I do not want you to sell to a member of this class of people, or I don't want you to rent to this type of person. Um, if you're faced with that, if you, on the one hand, you have fiduciary duty to follow the instructions of your client. So you can't just ignore their direct instructions. I mean, my advice in most of those situations would probably be to give the listing back, give the, give the property management contract back, just get away from those people because it's going to be a problem either either way you go. If you ignore their express directions, they're going to sue you. If you follow what they're telling you to do, you're going to get sued by some member of the public. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of those situations in this, and it's, it's they're really difficult judgment calls. That's why the, the number one rule, don't, don't engage in any knee-jerk reaction. Don't allow yourself that. You'd love to just tell them what you really think of their stupid request, but you can't do that. So step back, figure out the best way to phrase everything, and figure out a game plan to establish a good record of evidence that you're complying with the with the spirit and intent of the fair housing laws. Um, I think everything else we've pretty much, I talked about the new FIHA regulations. That's worthwhile if you're in, well, in fact, actually for all of you engaged either in brokerage or property management or owning rentals, it's worthwhile to go online and download a, a copy of these and read them. It'll take you a couple hours to read through them in detail, but it's got a lot of useful information and it kind of helps tune your thinking to fair, fair housing issues and makes you alert to situations so that when they do come up, you recognize them for what they are and can respond to them appropriately. And lastly, there, I've been dealing with, for years and years, with the Fair Employment and Housing Administration the, 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 well, basically the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, excuse me, I misspoke. They're charged with enforcing the Fair Employment and Housing Act in California. Last year, they changed their name. It's now California Civil Rights Department. That was effective in July of last year. And my experiences to date with the newly minted or newly named um, organization have been pretty good. I found their investigators to be fairly reasonable and responsive. Um, so far, so good. I've had good good experience with them. So, and they seem to have revamped a lot of their procedures. One of the things you have to do if you're a lawyer and you want to assert a a a claim of violation of the Fair Employment and Housing Act is you have to first make a complaint with them, get a right to sue letter. And they the situations where I've requested those from them, they've been pretty quick. It's an automated system that works very well. So. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that the Civil Rights Department may be going in a good direction with things. But if you hear from them, take it seriously. Go, go, go get advice right away and figure out a game plan. Again, don't respond to anything they ask for without thinking it through carefully, making sure you've got a good game plan. And that's it. Thank you very much.
<laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, wow, I, I, I know you've been there for a long time this afternoon, um, and we're going to try to be brief, but um, we're going to talk to you about politics. Uh, just briefly, um, I'm with Colin Powers, and Colin is our political rep from the California Association of Realtors, and he'll speak after I, I do. But uh, real quickly, I'm a, a contract consultant for your association. I serve as your government affairs director. Um, I help the legislative committee monitor uh, local issues, and I uh, more um, I, I pretty much drill down into county issues myself for the association. Um, I wanted to talk to you about a couple of issues. Uh, the, the primary issue that we're dealing with right now is called TOPA. It's the Tenant Opportunity, Opportunity to Purchase Act, and it's being proposed by the LA um, County Board of Supervisors. It would basically give uh, tenants the right of first refusal to purchase the building or condos that they live in um, if an owner decides to sell. It would require the owner to notify the tenants before they list a building and give them the fire, the the the, uh, the right of first refusal um, and try to put together some sort of purchase plan if they if they uh, if they choose. But at the same time, they also have the opportunity to give their right to a nonprofit which could be a city or a nonprofit organization. Uh, we, we've dealt with this in, in a couple of other cities. Uh, San Francisco has one in place and the county board is looking at the one that's in place in Washington, DC. The problem with these uh, programs is that they could take you up to a year uh, to sell a building because of all the hoops that you have to jump through. Uh, and at the same time, if a deal were to fall through, you would have to start the process all over again. So we're, we're fighting this. It's in a proposal uh, status right now. Uh, we're kind of frozen in time, but we know it's coming. So we've secured a grant from NAR and CAR to run an educational campaign, uh, not only to realtors, but also the public to uh, try to stop this in its tracks. The, the other issue I wanted to mention is, lo is a local issue and we're dealing heavily with rent control. Uh, you just heard a lot about the problems that rental property owners are having, but rent control in this state has become a big, a big issue. As you know, there's statewide rent control, but cities do have the right to strengthen the already um, burdensome state law by implementing uh, statutes at their local level. We're looking at that right now as a possibility in, in Alhambra. Um, they've frozen any um, uh, rehabilitation uh, projects uh, on buildings uh, so that tenants aren't evicted and they're actually looking at a, you know a, an eviction, a non-eviction statute, but also strengthening the rent control. So we're watching that for you as well. Um, I also deal with uh, local elections, and Colin deals with state elections, but we have a say-so at the local the local level. Um, just recently, for example, we we uh, recommended we took a took a position on Senate District 25 to be neutral in it because we have three of the top candidates happen to be city council members in cities that we deal with and work with. So, uh, you know, not to step on any toes, we wanted to kind of stay out of it. But we make those recommendations and we also fund those candidates at the local level to make sure that they're realtor friendly. Um, where do we get that money? Well, it's from the Realtor Action Fund um, and uh, that's divided into three sections. I'd like to show you a video now just to show you where your money goes. And Albert, if you could cue that up, you may think that being a realtor only means helping your clients find the property that is right for them. But did you know there are other forces that impact our ability to serve our clients? Every year, we face public policy challenges that could devastate the livelihood of realtors and the real estate industry. The good news is we have the Realtor Action Fund to promote and protect our businesses. The Realtor Action Fund raises money to help promote the values, attitudes, and beliefs of organized real estate. And did you know that every dollar is used to protect and advance realtor interest in government? It is the force behind protecting private property rights on every level. While you are focusing on the issues most critical for your business and your clients, through the Realtor Action Fund, we remain vigilant against potential public policy threats to our industry. Issues like fighting costly and time-consuming point-of-sale bills, 
Fighting independent contractor withholding. Fighting statewide service taxes. Preserving dual agency and preserving mortgage interest deduction. Supporting the Realtor Action Fund is not a political decision, but rather an important decision to protect your business. It is the way you can voluntarily join with your colleagues to help elect candidates who support our industry. While these dangers are limitless, our financial resources are not. We need you to become a contributor today. By contributing to the Realtor Action Fund, you are part of the team that is helping to protect private property rights and creating the opportunity to help someone achieve home ownership. Realtor Action Fund, fighting for our profession. So you 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 saw those five issues which we can we, we constantly deal with. I mean, point of sale issues, uh, dual agency, uh, protecting your right of an in, in your agents as a you know independent contractors. Um, but um, this is a very very important uh, part of what we do. And uh, on your dues billing, you'll see a section where it gives you an opportunity to donate to the Realtor Action Fund, and for the minimal amount that you contribute it goes a long long way calling me tell you but uh last year i believe the figure was about ten thousand uh, dollars we equated would be worth uh, ten thousand dollars that we saved realtors for that year just by fighting bills or supporting those that are going to help the industry so uh, my last pitch to you would get your agents to participate in the raf there are several, two contests that we do every year. One happens to be at the dues billing visa sweepstakes. If they give $20 extra on top of what their dues, uh, what we collect in the dues, they'll qualify for that. Uh, we ask for 49, but $20, $20 qualifies them for that. Uh, we also do, and you probably just experienced it, we do the office to office challenge where offices go head to head against each other to see who can get the highest percentage participation from their agents. So I, I would I would encourage you to, to watch for those contests and also tell your agents how important the Realtor Action Fund is. It is it's what we do to keep you in business. We are one of the strongest lobbyists um, in, at the local level, the state level, and the federal level, but we need your help uh, with that financial support. And with that, I want to introduce Colin Powers, who is the political representative from CAR, who has uh, West San Gabriel Valley Realtors as one of his uh, members that he that he that he works with. And he's going to give you a brief update on state issues. And then, if you have any questions, we'll answer those afterward. But we were trying to save you a little time because we know you're uh, you've gone over. But uh, anyway, so with that, Colin, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and uh, what your job entails, and uh, give us a little update. Thanks, Colin. Yeah, happily. Uh, first off, thank you, Jim, for that introduction. And hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Colin Powers, and I am the CAR Member Mobilization Specialist um, located in Southern California. So in my role, we have four other or three other field reps that do somewhat similar work that I do. Um, the field reps, uh, we have one in the Central Valley. We have one in the Bay Area, one in the... Um, greater LA area, um, but I was lucky enough to get West San Gabriel Valley, which has my northernmost association, and San Diego in the south. Um, I uh, I basically, the easiest way to say it is I work as a liaison between our local associations and the state association. So if there's ever any questions you have, any issues you have, any concerns you have, please feel free to reach out to me and I will answer that to the best of my ability. And my promise is if I can't answer it, I will find someone who can, or I will ask them for the answer and then get that to you. I am here to be of service to you. And if you ever, ever have anything, please, please feel free to reach out to me. So I'm going to share my screen really quick. Um, as Jim was saying, um, we just finished our legislative cycle. Um, and so this is kind of the, um, this is the culmination of the year um, legislatively. Um, I'm going to try and go through this quick, even though I think legislation is the most exciting portion of everything you've gone through today. Um, that's a joke, by the way. Uh, this uh, I'm going to try and get through it relatively quickly, just to kind of give you a taste of the laws we've worked on um, all year. Uh, in the next weeks, you should receive a similar mailer with the information I'm giving you right now. Um, and on that mailer will be a, a more extensive list. Um, but like I said, uh, I picked, I think, seven for today that we're going to go over. Um, and if you ever, if you have any questions at the end, feel free to ask. Um, but let's get into it. 
So uh, for starters, this year we worked on AB225. This was our sponsored bill, which means it was our idea. Um, this bill, we, we've seen consumers deal with uh, issues like wildfires, climate change, and sea level rise at a growing frequency in the past decade. Um, because of this, we wanted to update the state's residential environmental hazard booklet to include three new chapters on these issues that I previously mentioned. Because we we believe, or we see consumers, and we believe they should both want and need this information going forward. Um, I don't believe this bill received a no vote um, this this cycle, which we're very excited about, and it passed and is being um, chaptered into law. Uh, as you'll notice, I do have a QR code. I believe I have a QR code on almost every slide in my presentation. They're pretty fancy. Uh, if you take out your cell phone, if you're not familiar, turn on your camera app, point it at the screen, at that little box, and a link will pop up and that link will take you to ledgeinfo.com. Uh, this is pretty much the gold standard. If you're interested in legislation, um, which I think probably very few of you are, but if you are, um, it'll take you there. It's the gold standard for legislative research. Legislators use it, staffers use it, lobbyists, everyone, this is where to go. So if you ever have questions about legislation, Ledge Info, and uh, this will get you there. Um, so that's AB 225. Moving on to another piece of sponsored legislation. Again, this was our idea. This was AB 1280 by Assemblymember Mainshine. Now, uh, this year, the Office of the State Fire Marshal and uh, Cal Fire updated the state's fire hazard severity zone map. Um, they included a new category this year for high fire severity zones, which was not currently in the natural hazard disclosure form. AB 1280 is a simple form fix. It adds this new chapter uh, or new section to include information related to defensible space mandates um, on parcels in these high fire severity zones. Um, so this bill, again, it wasn't a major bill or anything, but you know it's useful. Um, this bill passed. I, again, I don't believe any no votes. And if you scan that QR code, it'll take you there as well. Um, moving on to oppose legislation. Now, this was a bad one that we were actually able to stop. So go team. Uh, this was SB 584. Uh, this dealt with short-term rentals. Um, this bill wanted to impose a 15% tax on owners of short-term rentals, even if that owner was just renting out a room in their house. Um, we opposed this bill from the start, um, but it actually took a coordinated effort from our members in certain areas around the state, um, and we were able to defeat this bill. And we're very, very excited about that, that this bill, SB 584, will not be moving forward this year. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit of depth on it. Sorry, but th this bill, this this tax, this 15% tax, they wanted to put into a general fund that that money would have been used to, um, we well, used on different projects. And some of those projects were affordable housing. Now you hear that and coming from CAR where we believe in affordability and accessibility and you know equity and fair housing for all, that's something that we would normally believe. But by adding taxes on private property rights, by attacking private property rights, um, that's something that, that we can't live with because by raising those taxes, that's going to remove naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, and it's a punishment to, to, current, prop, to current homeowners. Um, so that's something that we opposed. And like I said, uh, we opposed it. And thanks to our membership, we're able to stop this bill in its tracks. Moving on, we have SB 460 by Senator Wahab. This bill would have banned criminal background checks for rental housing. Need I say more? Um, this bill was actually stopped pretty much out of the gate. Um, I, I don't even believe it got out of its first committee. Um, it stopped very quickly and we're very excited about that. So this bill will also not be moving forward this year. Um, next, we have SB 395, and this is also by Senator Wahab. This uh, would have established a statewide rental registry. Now, I have been at CAR for going on three years, and I have been a part of the government affairs team that has stopped this bill um, three years in a row. However, this bill outdates me because it's actually been stopped four times. If you've ever heard the term zombie bill, that is the, the rental registry bill has become the bane of my existence. This bill will not go away. Um, this bill wants to establish a statewide rental registry in which it would mandate that property owners would have to submit a wide variety of proprietary information on their tenants to a new state entity. Um, they want it that this would be able to keep track of all the rentals in California. But what the bill doesn't take into account 
is the staff, time, resources, um, and money that it would take these landlords, uh, property owners, mom and pop, no matter what size, to complete um, this added task on top of their day-to-day -day, you know, work. Um, like I said, doesn't take that into, in, into account. Um, and if they failed to comply, they would have been met with fines or worse. Um, so this is a bill that we've opposed pretty regularly for the past four years, quite literally, and we have stopped every time. Um, this year, we stopped it again. If we see it again next year, obviously we're doing something right. We'll stop it again. Um, but rest in peace, or but sleep sleep in peace tonight, not rest in peace, sleep in peace tonight, as this bill will not be moving forward this year. Um, <laughs> next, uh, this bill unfortunately did pass. I'm just going to preface it with that. This is a bad one that got through the cracks. This is ACA one. It's a you'll see this on the ballot in November as a proposition. What this bill aims to do is lower the necessary voter. November What's twenty twenty four. Make sure you make sure they know that. November oh, did I? Sorry, November twenty twenty four. Not not this month. Next or next year. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, this is going to lower the necessary voter threshold from a two third supermajority to a fifty five per to fifty five percent to approve local general obligation bonds and special taxes for affordable housing and public infrastructure projects. Now, by lowering that, it's obviously making it easier to raise taxes. Um, normally, well, to, to walk you through my mindset when I'm reading this, approving you know, bonds, it's gonna make it easier. I'm like, okay, go on. And then I see we're raising taxes on you know, affordable housing, raising taxes for affordable housing and public infrastructure projects. Public infrastructure, that's such a broad term, it could mean anything. If you want to take a phrase from this bill, ACA1, is it's going to make it easier for local governments to raise taxes on its constituents. Um, we are opposed to this bill. We fought it tooth and nail all the way, um, all the way through through the, um, the legislature, but unfortunately it got through. Um, we will be meeting it at the ballot, though, in November of, of 2024. Thank you, Jim. Um, and we'll see it there. And we're going to need your help to do that. Um, I'm going to go into a couple ways and a little bit of how you can help us fight it uh, next November. And lastly, ACA 13. Um, this bill is kind of complicated. I'm going to try and make it as simple as possible. Um, this is another constitutional amendment proposition that made it through this year, despite our opposition. Um, this bill is going to impose a higher percentage of votes needed to approve state and local measures if led by citizens. Basically, right now, if you want, if a group of citizens wanted to get something on the ballot as a proposition, um, they would collect signatures, get it on there, and it would pass with a majority vote. What this bill is going to do is raise that that vote, the majority, like I said, to a two thirds, making it harder for citizen led ballot initiatives to pass. However, these restrictions are not on legislature, on the legislature. They can also, they can get something on the ballot with a simple majority, making it harder for citizens to, to fight against tax increases by limiting their ability to um, get things on the ballot. Uh, this bill, we, we oppose it. You probably saw red alerts on it. We are going to fight this one tooth and nail as well, along with ACA1, but we are going to need your help. And there are three ways that you can do this. For starters, vote. Uh, if you're not registered to vote, I encourage you to do so. Um, you can use this QR code. It'll take you to the Secretary of State's website where you can register to vote in a matter of seconds. Um, make sure you get your agents, family, friends, everyone registered to vote because we're going to need all of them going forward into this, into this fight we have here. Um, next is ACT. If you see a red alert come through, please, please respond. I promise it's not spam. I'm actually the guy sending out those red alerts. So when you don't open them, I take it personally. I'm just kidding. But uh, I really, uh, we really need you to open these. Um, it takes a couple of seconds to respond. Um, you'll usually see them in your email inbox under important because they are. And um, we're usually either asking you to make a call on a certain bill or send an email. Now, if it's a call, I promise you, you're not going to get interrogated by who's ever um, on the other end of the phone. It's probably an 18-year-old intern who turned off TikTok to answer your phone call. He doesn't know what you're talking about. You're going to get, tell him you know, no on ACA 13, for example. He's going to put you in a list, and that's what we need. Uh, we need to let the legislature know how we feel, how their constituents feel about 
legislation happening. They need to understand that we have over two, we have around 200,000 members, realtors in the state of California that care about these issues. So if you ever see a red alert, please respond. It makes a world of a difference when they see that their district, their constituents, their voters are calling, asking them to vote a certain way. Yeah, call so remember, leave, that, leave that slide up for just a minute. I wanted to yeah. point out at the bottom. If you text the word realtor to 30644, that'll sign you up to get red alerts. And let us let us assure you, there are there are not very many. You're not going to get a call for action every day. You probably might get one or two, uh, maybe three during the whole legislative session. So, uh, but it's important that that you become part of our team that will work with us to encourage our legislators to do the right thing. And I can say, Jim, that was excellent estimation. Um, I just did a report for uh, CAR. Uh, this cycle, we sent out two red alerts and last cycle we sent out three. So <laughs> yeah, that was, that was right on the nose. We're not gonna spam you, I promise. Um, moving forward, invest, like, like we just watched the video, invest in the RAF. It's a huge, huge, um, resource that we have and it's it's a way that that we advocate for for ourselves for our business our industry uh jim was also right on the nose with with that estimation last year in 2022 we were able to save each realtor over ten thousand dollars and each firm over sixteen thousand dollars thanks to our members investment in their business uh, that's by you know reducing exposure to lawsuits preventing uh, point of sale retrofits preserving, preserving dual agency these are all things that that we've done thanks to our education efforts through the raf and another way to look at it is, you know, we buy insurance on everything, our homes, our cars, our pets, our phones. But what about your business? This is a great way to invest in yourself, invest in your business and invest in the RAF. It goes a very long way. On average, it costs us $148 per year per realtor. Obviously, I'm not asking you to give $148 today. I'm asking you to give what you can when you can, because it goes a very, very, very long way. Um, so with that, remember to vote, act and invest. And um, if, if you liked the legislation talk today, I am happy to say that as of yesterday, I believe, I, I uploaded episode 13 of our Unlocking Politics podcast, which is a recap of this year, um, this legislative cycle, moderated by our very own Senior Vice President of Government Affairs, Sanjay Wagle, and two of our lobbyists, uh, Kareem Dreesey and Jen Speck. And it's a great resource. Uh, they were the ones who were in the room where it happened, if you will. Uh, they worked on on these bills, and it's a great, great place to um, to get that information as well. And so, with that, um, thank you. Happy to answer any questions, and um, thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question from Mindy. Hi, Colin. Hi, Jim. So, hi there. Hi. So, I was um, inquiring about Assembly Bill Twelve. You know, Governor Newsom signed it. It it states that the security deposit can no more be cannot be no more than one month's rent starting next year. So um don't mean to put you guys to the spot on the spot, but you know, for housing providers, how can CAR help, you know, the housing providers to address this issue? Because if, if our clients buy a brand new property, one month's rent is really not enough to cover if the tenants did not pay the last month's rent and they use that and you need to hire an attorney to evict them and the sheriff. Yeah, obviously, obviously that was something that we opposed along with the uh, yeah. the apartment association. <clears throat> um, uh, you know, CAA and and locally uh, AGLA, but uh, it's I'll tell you, it's it's the culture that we're dealing with right now in Sacramento. I mean, they they truly have shown an anti uh, rental property owner uh, streak over the last few years. Uh, a lot of it, a lot of it was sparked up, you know, by COVID. They just started thinking about other, other, other uh, uh, things to, you know, burden uh, rental property owners with. But, you know, we we fought that one. I, I think that I think it's still two months for furnished apartments, but yeah, it went down to one month. So, quite frankly, uh, that's a security deposit. Um, and uh, uh, if if someone doesn't, you know, pay the the last month rent after the third day, you can file an unlawful detainer, obviously. But uh, I I know that. Uh, there's nothing left to um, clean or, you know, left for cleaning or repairs or anything like that because you have to suck it away for the rent. 
Yeah, it was a, it was a bad bill. We opposed it. It, it passed. It was signed by our governor. Um, but uh, you know, it you know down the line, maybe it's something that uh, the apartment association and along with CAR can look at to uh, <clears throat> to uh, reinstate. Because it's good. It, it, there are going to be a, there are going to be a lot of landlords that lose money. And, and in that same vein, I, I do want to say that CR always has, you know, resources on, on standby. We have the legal hotline, which is available to our members 24-7. Um, if you ever have any issues, any questions about how to comply, things you can do. Any other further questions? Um, maybe last question, because um, we are a little bit over our time. I just want to thank you all. Um, I Is there any questions on Zoom? Okay. I don't see, I don't believe so, right? Uh, no, we didn't see any in the chat either. Well, thanks, thanks for your time. Chat. Yeah, thanks for your yeah. time, everybody. We appreciate it. And take that message that Colin left you with. Take it back to your offices and tell your tell your uh, your agents uh, that that message. We 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 need your we need your help, um, and uh, we need you to support the cause. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. I'll see you around soon, hopefully. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Colin. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Can't hear it. But anyway. All right. Bye, Jim. All right. Bye, guys. All right. So um we're at the very closing end. Uh, so I I will just make it real quick. I want to introduce Albert Tran, who's gonna lead us to our next topic, and then he's just gonna close us out. So we could be out here hopefully in a few minutes. Albert, take it away. We're gonna talk about NAR broker tools and C2EX. That's part of the um the grant money that we receive from NAR. Today's the entire events were funded by NAR and the West San Diego Valley Realtors. Um, so hopefully you enjoy it today with all the wonderful topics. It's very difficult to get a top-notch speakers coming in as well as provide you a wonderful lunch and all kind of stuff. Uh, so I would like to go through very quickly to uh, for the brokers or even you, if you not broker, bring it back to your brokers. If you want to find out inf make any information about NAR broker to go to nar.realtor slash brokers. We're going to send all the PowerPoint to you uh, afterwards too. So um, they'll need to take a picture. Once you type it that web, uh, web address, nar.realtor slash broker, you will see this screen. And in this screen, on the left-hand side, you can see that uh, legal resources and all the information legal, like right? for instance, the lawsuit um, that have been mentioned by Jim, by uh, our, uh, our color CEO, CMLS, and all those stuff right there. You can just click on the down below, click here, updates relating to that lawsuit, and it tells you everything. Remember, NR.Gritter slash brokers, okay? Because uh, some members ask, her, okay, give us an update about it. This is where you can uh, get update. When you click on the next one, um, in the legal resources, it's going to tell you everything about the federal issues, key issues, as well as state, which you heard from uh, Colin Powers earlier. You can go here to take a look at state, narrow down when you click on that state down below, NAR state issue tracker, and so on. And you go to California, it will tell you everything, all the issues that Colin Powers mentioned earlier. Okay. We're going to go to safety resources. Oh, this is another website here um, because of the lawsuits. And you come up with this uh, website, competition.realtor. When you go to that website, it's more consumer, pro consumer, because um, the lawsuits that we are more uh, for the realtor, but actually we really pro consumer help uh, preserve the home ownership. So go to that website there uh, if you uh, like. And then Back to uh, the broker website, click on safety, it tells you all about safety. Remember we have safe, there's a safety month in September that we have some presentation here. That's why some of the information that you can see up there as well from NAR, okay? Next one is broker involvement, how the broker can get involved to um, a program such as this. Your involvement get voiced on the Capitol Hill, which is the Western DC, easy to manage solution and proven results, and so on. And again, you click on that link, 
Next one, NAR has a broker summit, just like we do today, but it's a larger scale, uh, more in the federal level, like uh, uh, chief economists from the National Association, which are talking about um, the economy throughout the country, uh, whereas today we focus on more in the state. That's why we invite chief economists from the uh, California Association, which are talking about uh, our state. Last, there's a broker edge. It will give you more information on that website, give you housing update, market branding, retention recruitment, AI and chat GBT, legal updates, sustainability, as well as advocacy. So everything in this here, you can uh, go to this if you register for it. Um, I think it's gonna be in Massachusetts. Unfortunately, it's gonna have to fly there and so on, but at least, you can find some information. Hopefully one day they're going to have it in California. Which is the one earlier you saw it, it is in San, San Diego. I'm sorry, go, go back. That was in San Diego. This one is in Massachusetts. It's a different event on your broker website. Okay, and our broker website. Next, I'm going to take you to C2EX. That, this is one requirement and I want us to know. They, um, five years ago in Anaheim, and I launched this program called C2EX. What's it stand for? Anybody know? C stands for commit. Two is two. EX is excellence. Committed to excellence. What they do you try to do is elevate all the realtors in more competency. So let me talk a little bit about, about the pump up the volume meanings that they have reached out to 151,000 members participate in this program. 18,000 of them are ready to get endorsed. What was that mean? Endorsement. I myself also endorsed. I went through all the 11 courses, which the next page is going to talk about it, and uh, just go through it. It's completely free to the membership. So um, you, you can sign up and, and go through that program within a few months. You can get it done. Or if, if you read fast, you follow fast, maybe within a few days, you will get it endorsed. You just finish the program, no task, no nothing, and then you just finish it up and then they get. If you ever get endorsed, I mean, how many people get endorsed? Nobody? Okay, we're going to push more <laughs> in, in our association. So um, if you get endorsed, you can go to NAR Expo on November 12th from 2 to 5 to have some goodies for you. Um, and I was going to launch a mobile-friendly website for the C2EX, and it's completely free. You can see under no additional cost there. You just do your own. Uh, what this cover is, when you finish the C2EX, it's automatically uh, fulfill your NAR code ethics. NAR code ethics normally take you two and a half hours or three hours to finish every three years, that cycle. Next year is going to be that cycle. So we have to push everybody to finish their code ethic. So, um, and these are the courses that um, you get, uh, you, you go through all these courses and you get that. They don't call it destination, they don't call it certification. They say endorse. Okay. First one is client services, you're helping your uh, clients. And fair housing, which is Jim was talking about, advocacy, which is uh, Jim Clark is talk talking about. A professional reputation, trust and integrity, area of practice, technology. This is very interesting. When you look at technology, I might talk about AI and I'll talk about all those up to date social media. We say law, uh, safeguard, privacy, code, code ethics. And then for the broker, they have some a, a bonus section for you uh, to use as well. They also have an enhanced broker path. Um, let's say you have a new agent come in, join your company. What do you do? How, how do you do this? And you know, there's a they show you about a listing presentation, agent relationship, and all those information there. Also, this help you to set up the policy, develop the policy of the conversation, how to get paid, commission, uh, technology, how do you handle that, and operation. So they have all, everything here. Also, last one is the agent coaching, how to help coach your agent as well, how to keep them. Okay. So, so those are the ones. And um, this is going to have more detailed information that when the, the person get endorsed, they can access the website and then um, the information will be there. 
Now, next one is when the person is yours, you can see it. Um, there, there is some kind of referral program between the uh, uh, the daughter. For instance, I endorse and Jeff also endorse in another state. I you, you can go and look it up, look them up, and refer back and forth. So it's like a network things. Um, so you can look it up when you get into the website. You can look up by state and find out who that endorse versus. Okay, there is a renew process that they want every two, uh, three years. So you have to uh, renew. So that's go with the uh, COVID ethic recycle, uh, COVID ethic cycle. Next year is going to be a cycle. So many people is going to go through that renew. So once they finish this renewal, the COVID ethics will be compliant as well. So basically, you just go back. For those of you who have endorsed, like myself, I just go back to uh, the website and take all those 11 courses again, and I, I will finish it and very quick. So what the benefit to the broker? Broker has an admin benefit to see there's a training tool in there, the admin access to track agents' progress. Let's say you have 10 agents and you want to find out how they do with the um, C2EX. This is a way to track them. There's an admin dashboard. And then the, you can upload the broker brand in there too. Um, the um, when you log into the website, they give you the broker admin uh, feature there, and uh, those used for the agent progress, endorsement re report, and library access. Um, and this is the inside the broker dashboard to tell that particular agent or uh, agent from the office what is the progress of that person doing with the endorsement until uh, you can see the, the almost to the last one, um, mortgage CBC 100%, meaning that person already finished the entire program to get endorsed, okay? So, so you know, this is how you do it in the, uh, add the new agents into it uh, in the dashboard. Um, at least 80% of agents in the office are C2AX. If you want to be broker office endorsement, at least 80% of agents in the office are C2EX endorsed. The managing broker must be C2EX endorsed. So um, apply, and then you can apply for that uh, at the nar.router slash C2EX slash broker. If the broker really wants to get into program and monitor all the agents to finish the C2EX, the, the there line there, you go you apply it, and then um, you make sure there's 80% of them finished the program. Why and are doing this? I mean, and are doing this is to help realtor elevate their professions, professionalism. And uh, so that people, you know, they learn about code ethics, they learn about technology, they learn about all the things that you saw on the earlier, we we'll talked about 10 or 11 uh, items on, on the list. Once the person get endorsed, they can using this as a way to market themselves is a more uh, competent uh, realtor. So I, you know, I'm, I'm go very quick, five, 10 minutes here, and I hope that everyone will look into this C2EX program um, in the future, since we don't, nobody get endorsed here yet, I will uh, work hard to get our association uh, members to get into this program as much as possible. Uh, Lauren, no, this is completely free. All free, the classes is free, but every three years they want us to renew it. That's I hope you enjoy your presentation. Thank you very much. Just stay all the way to the end and um, and hope we have more and more of this kind of classes, you know, bring it to the association next year. Again.